So does he, do you have um, the way your Zoom is set up? Will he have access to share? Yes, I'll make, make sure I'm going to make sure he's a, a, a panelist. We have to, I guess we got to be even more clear with them about that. <laughs> yeah. if this is not pretty. Just, it's not pretty. So, and but, it, frankly, it's really 98% the party's fault. So, mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Okay, so Lisa didn't, mm -hmm. she was also, she came into it in a mess too. And if you read the transcript, it was really messy. It wasn't nice. Like, mm -hmm. nobody was playing nicely because there was massive, awful litigation. I've done it now since one. Okay, right. So, seems like you won pretty uh, much. Jason Snipe with me. I'm like, no, I don't want the weird.
Okay. Oh, just, just what do you mean? Why are you slides? Okay. 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 I know Carter. I thought so. No. I was like, really? Just another Republican millionaire. Well, we we have a Democratic governor who's the trust fund, and I I like the guy. Yeah. Have you seen his ethics Yeah. Well, so yeah, the, the, the pamphlets are just our own. So I have the funny story about such really lovely Remember the first thing I said to you? He just complimented me. He told me you hate the senator. No, I think the senator. Oh, you hate the senator. It's total over the house. No comment. comment. But I will make the same thing. If there's that, yes. Because you could write something of somewhere maybe not even that. That's a gift of life. It's a gift. I'll leave on that. Uh, good morning. Thank you, everyone, uh, for attending. We'll give you another minute. So if people would like to uh, come in and get their seats, we do have a very uh, tight agenda today. So um, we're going to try to get uh, right into this. Um, so we'll, we'll get started in a few seconds, All right, uh, with that, uh, good morning. I want to thank everyone uh, for coming to the fourth meeting of the Connecticut AI Task Force and welcome you all here. Just a little bit of background about the Connecticut uh, AI Task Force. It was created out of Senate Bill 1103, which we had passed last year, which started by looking at uh, regulating government use of artificial intelligence, uh, DAS, Department of Administration, Services and OPM are coming up with their 
policies and procedures, uh, and, and they are currently doing an inventory of all instances where the state is using artificial intelligence. Yeah. That inventory will be published by December 31st of this year. Policies and procedures will be in effect by February 1 of next year, 2024. But also as a part of that bill, we created the United AI Task Force to look at um, many one additional pretty significant production of large chats um, coming out next week or so. Can everyone who's listening on the students please be there? I know I said I was done, but one more uh, time. Uh, please, uh, please, and please, please, sign, please. Uh, Apple and IARC confidentiality agreements, uh, please uh, do so. Let me see. Um, uh, Jimmy, I'll send them to you. I know I leave that. Uh, but it's likely that at least some. Okay. All right, um, to look at making recommendations. Think that uh, our colleagues in the government are so interested in AI and how the state can facilitate and promote the use of AI for the growth of industry and also for the betterment of society. So uh, it's a wonderful that you're doing this, and, and I expect uh, one uh, great things to come from uh, this conference and, and future conferences. So uh, speaking on behalf of Yale University, we are making historic investments in data science and artificial intelligence. This includes um, investing in many new faculty, new facilities, and significant new research infrastructure. Data science and AI was identified a few years ago by Professor, uh, then at the time, Professor Scott Tobel, now our Provost Scott Tobel, as one of the main foci for um, uh, investment for the university as a strategic investment. Um, there uh, already, in just a few uh, short years, we have uh, new buildings that are focused around data science and AI. So there's a building that's called, used to be called the Pine Biology Building, it's now Pine Power, very close to here, just reopened. It has a 140 million gut renovation that includes a, the Department of Statistics and Data Science, the Department of Mathematics, and the Department of Astronomy, as well as, as a new institute for the Foundation for Data Science, which is focused on developing tools and techniques to uh, apply data science and AI to. Uh, 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 different uh, disciplines uh, as a program. We also have a new 
section in biomedical informatics and data science uh, in the School of Medicine. But soon we should expect that to become a dark department. And Priscilla is here in the back of the room. She'll be speaking to you uh, later today about uh, in the healthcare field what we're doing as a university, particularly through the School of Medicine, in uh, promoting and developing our AI infrastructure and that the academic growth in artificial intelligence. Um, you know, artificial intelligence is not a new field. It's actually been around for quite some time. Um, I got my PhD in 1991, and my PhD at the time was in the field of neural networks, which is an old term for artificial intelligence. Uh, what's happened, though, over the course of the last 30 years, uh, dramatically in the last five years, is the growth of potential computer infrastructure. And because computers have become so fast and the ability to hold uh, reams of data is so huge, the development of new machine learning tools has dramatically exponentially increased and its impact on society is ever more obvious for the generative AI. But AI has been and will continue to be used. It's been used for decades and is currently being used throughout the community, including the medical uh, community. So it's not, a, it's not really a new thing, but it's due to the degree of its impact on our community. So Yale has, under the um, uh, auspices of Scott Schroeder, our provost, convened an AI task force. It's uh, perhaps not unlikely that the task force is doing for the state, but it's uh, obviously focused on Yale. And actually, just in October, a group of uh, leaders visited uh, the Silicon Valley for a two day retreat about AI, where we considered from experts at uh, Google and OpenAI and Microsoft and Wikimedia and DeepMind uh, what they're experiencing in terms of the power and growth of AI and what impact that might have on academic communities. And uh, Scott, uh, since then, Scott Scholl has um, established a panel that will meet uh, several dozen times over the course of the next three years, I'm um, sorry, three months, with specific deliverables by April, where we will look at the role of AI in research, in education, in practice, and preservation, and to make sure that the university is on top of and in tune with the dramatically expanding power of AI. And it would be uh, wonderful to do that in concert and collaboration with, uh, with the state. So there are myriad opportunities for the university to collaborate uh, across uh, the, with government partners and industrial partners. Um, uh, especially for Yale, we have an exceptional um, uh, academic medical center, which, in, which for healthcare AI should be a dramatically uh, facilitating partner for the establishment of AI uh, commercial opportunities in the state. The state, um, uh, from my very brief perspective, can really facilitate the growth of an AI uh, community, uh, a uh, commercial community in the state, by lowering barriers for the use of data across different um, disparate data sets right now. So the state has lots of data sets that are um, healthcare data sets, which right now are safely and securely used and shared, but they're in disparate buckets. They're not combined together into one data bucket, which can be generally used by the community. If that was possible and the state could uh, lower the barrier to access to, of, those, um, of those data sources, which are currently shared, but not shared in a way which is, uh, it, which, which is combined across the different data buckets, it could have a dramatically positive influence on the growth of AI commercial opportunities in the state. Of course, we want to do it safely, but the state has a demographic which mirrors the entire country. So what we do with data in healthcare in Connecticut can, can really reproduce or reflect what the whole country can expect to grow or learn from AI. So doing it uh, safely, sharing it across our communities, our diverse communities, but doing it in a way where the state doesn't present a barrier, but rather encourages the use of this data for the benefit of the community would be it, my modest um, suggestion for how we should proceed. So again, um, I'm, I'm delighted to, that Yale can host uh, the, the AI task force. The academic, I hope the academic partners can, for you, can be considered a real net positive, and we can work together to um, better understand the role of AI, the impact of AI, and uh, expand the opportunity for AI and better in uh, the health and welfare of our community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. But, uh, next is no stranger either on the state side or the Yale side, uh, but Josh Duvall, who is the Vice Provost for 
entrepreneurship, uh, senior associate focus on entrepreneurship and innovation at Yale University. You run Yale Ventures, but you also have worked with us in the state at EAS and you see all as well. So, uh, Josh, uh, please go on. Thank you, uh, Stan Maroney, for your, your leadership on this task force. It is great to see some uh, familiar faces uh, from my time in Hartford, both in the legislature. I see a number of legislators here, as well as well known from the press. And <laughs> um, so, uh, so, as uh, Senator mentioned, uh, well, I guess run an organization here called Yale Ventures. Um, and I'll explain in a moment what that is and why I've called into this discussion. Just, in terms of my background, although um, before coming back to Yale, I spent three years at Harvard, most of my career is in the, in the tech industry. So 20 years spanning um, over a little over a decade at IBM in our technology services business, number of different roles there. Um, left to become the CEO of a small software startup that was doing software as a service for scientific data, uh, scientific data management. Um, we grew and ultimately were acquired by Thermal Fisher Scientific, ran their digital science business. So the intersection of technology and software and health and life sciences is, is one that I've been operating for a while. I think it's an incredibly exciting and dynamic space to be in, especially right now, especially related to this topic. So I'm, I'm delighted to be part of this discussion. Um, as mentioned, I came to almost two years ago for a new role that might uh, actually spearhead the creation of, um, which was done to really um, identifying the, the need and the opportunity to be able to do more to support entrepreneurship and innovation across the campus. So historically over the last uh, 10, 20 years, um, and Mike mentioned the strength of our academic medical center here at the School of Medicine, we had typically launched about uh, 10 or so uh, startup companies per year based on the research discoveries in our labs that were almost entirely biotech companies, biotech startups that had over you know, the last couple of decades, given rise to now what is a very vibrant, growing, robust bioscience ecosystem centered here in New Haven, but really with tentacles out across the state. Um, and so School of Medicine continues to grow, continues to be an enormous amount of innovation there, which will continue to fuel the growth of that life sciences, that biotech ecosystem. But what's really exciting right now is the degree to which the growth in our School of Engineering, uh, which Mike alluded to, we've made historic investments in our School of Engineering. A lot of people are surprised to also learn that computer science has become the second most popular undergraduate major at Yale. When I was an undergraduate here uh, a long time ago, um, computer science almost didn't exist. I, I, I don't know if I had any friends who were computer science majors here. Now it's the second most popular major, actually, I think, on track to us now is going to become the most popular. And the university is really embracing the, mm -hmm. the opportunity of demand with enormous investments in the physical infrastructure as well, both here on Science Hill, down the central campus, lower Hill House area, which will, over the next decade or so, will really transform the campus in a way that results in an enormous and really incredible engineering uh, campus center uh, down in the middle, right in the part of the central campus that will continue to drive growth in uh, computer science and engineering here at the school. And what's really exciting about that is the degree to which the culture at Yale is very collaborative across schools, across departments. A lot of the startups that we get to support and a lot of the projects the students get involved in are very cross-school, cross-departmental collaboration between our faculty. And so we have this growing school of engineering, we have this incredible strength in our sciences and health and medicine, and we're seeing more and more combinations of those uh, collaborations, uh, particularly embracing you know, new technologies, including AI, that are really helping launch some really exciting new ventures. So, um, in our role at Yale Ventures, we do a lot of things to help support the translation of these research discoveries into new startup companies. We do the tech transfer work, which is you know patenting the new discoveries and then licensing them out. We also do a lot of work to support faculty and students to think about how to take their idea and actually build a business around it and market the resources, whether that's the people, the investment, the, um, the, uh, the space, the physical infrastructure where necessary to be able to spin up those companies, hopefully keep them here in, in Connecticut where they can grow and thrive. And what's really exciting, particularly in the area of AI now, as we've seen all of this growth, is an increasing number of startups that are either uh, launching or or we'll be launching probably in the next year or so 
that are in, you know at the intersection of AI, AI applications, and health and life sciences. And I'll give you just a few examples. So we're seeing AI startups in, in diagnostics. Uh, one that's really exciting right now called NSAFE AI, launched by uh, Dr. Rohan Kara, which is using AI to read standard, widely available electrocardiogram images and gather data from other wearables like Apple Watch. And to be able to do diagnostics to identify significant heart uh, issues and risks well before they present uh, as, as problems and enable early intervention in ways that obviously will save lives and improve people's health, but also save a lot of burden in the healthcare system as well. So that's one that's falling down. We have a, a number of projects and startups that are using AI to um, accelerate the process of drug discovery. Um, uh, more AI, Next Target AI, Senpio, these are all companies uh, that are forming that are again, using AI to identify targets and optimize molecules in ways that will hopefully speed up the drug discovery process. Um, and then we have AI applications that are being applied for operational benefit as well. And we've got one project that's coming together now, it's not a name yet, but it's basically using AI to help automate and, uh, and improve the efficiency of uh, hospital practice operations in ways that probably will reduce costs, improve quality, make better use of the precious time of our clinicians and nurses in the hospital setting. So it's just a little bit of a, a tip of the iceberg of some of the really exciting innovation that's going on at Yale. We'll see much more of that. It's incredibly hot space here, obviously. But we're delighted to help support and engage in this task force in any other way we can. Um, it's an incredible opportunity for Connecticut. I think as we talk today, I'm really excited about preparing notes and, and talking about ideas in some areas that, that where we see a lot of opportunity, particularly around direct support for nascent AI startups in the form of accelerators and incubators or hackathons. There's a lot of things we've been doing at Yale that we found that could be really helpful in terms of um, supporting these early stage uh, ventures. Uh, I think we all care really interest in retaining the talent that we're educating here in Connecticut and looking at opportunities for fellowships or internships that can connect our students and graduates with opportunities in AI here in Connecticut and uh, encourage more of them to stick around. And then also looking at uh, leveraging our scale across different organizations in Connecticut around you know, procuring access to things like Mike talked about, uh, some of the, the data that can be very helpful for these startups, some of the infrastructure, GPUs, et cetera, that are of critical importance, things that are in uh, if we all try to do them separately, it can be very challenging and expensive, but if we work together in a small scale, we should be able to. Uh, we potentially have a significant impact. So, really excited for today. Um, thank you for being here. Welcome to you Thanks, Josh. And uh, again, thank you to Gail uh, for hosting us. So, I think we're going to see that uh, theme throughout the, the importance of collaboration and continuing to work together. This is hopefully the start of a conversation or the continuum of a conversation among all of the people in this room that will need to grow uh, beyond this room as, as well. Um, our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. David Grucci. Uh, Dr. Grucci is, is an award-winning artificial intelligence researcher. He uh, led IBM's Watson project from its inception through the time when it uh, won on Jeopardy. He's been working in AI for over 25 years, and we've asked him to sum all that down into 10 minutes. So, the floor is now yours. Can we see that? Yes, excellent. So I have 10 minutes to boil this stuff down. Um, so let me just jump in there. Uh, I think we all are aware AI is now surpassing the levels of performance across many domains, domains, image recognition, voice recognition, predictive analysis, reading comprehension, question answering. I want to draw a box around the last few there, so I call the language effect, because this is what we're seeing is enormously significant with the advent of large language models and generative AI. So I want to spend a lot of time about what this really means and how significant that is. But first I want to go back and kind of level set 
um, what is AI really all about? Uh, and what is really underlying this? I think, and I apologize for many of you who may understand this, but this is something that I think is worth being relentless and boring about, right? These are very relatively simple devices in many ways called neural networks. Um, they find arbitrarily complex functions that relate input to output. That's not going to tell you exactly what that means in terms, of, I think, that we all understand. But it's important to realize that they can easily be at scale and just, just add more layers and they can find more complex functions. This is a really powerful notion. The way I want to explain this is how um, we, we have a sort of a clear and common understanding of what a simple regression is. Yeah. So how does it relate to weight? And we have to stop folks at the digital okay. units and then we approximate this line. And this line allows us to predict we can say, okay, now I have a new person given a weight, I can take a, a, a rational or predictive guess at what their height might be, or vice versa, because I've drawn the line. Now, the linear regression, the line becomes a way to predict the relation between those two variables. But now, if I put in more variables, like I put high, high weight and heart rate, I now have a multiple regression. And so now we have this like three dimensional plane, and I can use that to predict one variable from the other two, and vice versa. And imagine now I don't have three variables, but I have a thousand variables. So I have 10,000 variables, I have a million variables. This becomes a very complex function, but it's still kind of linear and it takes a particular shape. Deep neural networks allow us to find a relationship in variables in, in, in discontinuous, arbitrarily complex functions. That's the power of this. That means I can give it many, many variables and it will find that function that allows me to predict one from the many others. But that function that's in there, and this is the key point, while it can be powerfully predictive, it may be inscrutable to us. We don't understand that function. That function is not in the terms of the way we might conceptualize that. So predictive given the data, but not necessarily inscrutable or understandable by us. The more data, the more complex the function, the more predictive these things might be. But this is what they're doing. And what's powerful about them is I can do this on any data because the broad the neural network is concerned, it's just numbers. So here we have an image of a dog. I think each pixel which represents a number. I can label that a bunch of numbers that feed into that neural network. And then a human corrects it. And we iterate on this and say, yes, that is, it predicts it's a dog. Yes, that's a dog. No, it's not. It's an apple. No, it's a leaf. It's a toaster. And through this training data, that neural network will adjust its internal function, will adjust the coefficients, will adjust the internal function, so that it gets better and better at predicting the way we labeled that data. And we iterate this until it's getting it right, until it's predicting based on the bias, the bias that we gave it. We talk about bias, that's their job, is to find the bias, the skew in the data. So, and this can, this, you know, I did an image, but it could be voice, because voice can be represented in numbers. It could be a molecular structure, because that could be represented in numbers. It could be the game of Go. It could be time series on financial analytics. It's the same thing. That's what makes this such a powerful general capability, right? Is that this same neural network structure can apply across, across domains. And in fact, as was mentioned before, we're getting better and better applying these and developing these things. Right, if you look at where we were in handwriting recognition, speech recognition, image recognition, now reading comprehension, uh, reading comprehension, language right understanding, you're looking at a huge accelerated growth over the last several years, and now even taking off faster, especially in that language area. And that's what I want to talk about. Um, now, before I get to language, I want to make one point really clear, which I said earlier, but I want to emphasize with this example. Um, while that while we while these deep neural networks find these functions, they're able to predict things um, based on the training data. They, their internal models can be very, very different than our internal models. So this is an image of the Persian cat. The best image predictor at the time uh, identifies this with 80% accuracy, that they're 80% confidence that this is a Persian cat. This is also a Persian cat. It has been slightly modified, modified in ways that you can't even detect. And the same algorithm is 98% sure that this is a toaster. <laughs> this is not, this is not to suggest that, that image re AI image recognition is not good. It's super good. It's better in general than, than humans at these tests. But the mistake implies that there's a very different model for what makes a Persian cat. 
And statistically, you're going to rely on the incorrect matchup. But when it, when it makes a mistake, or how to predict the mistakes it might make, or how to anticipate where it would go wrong with a false positive or a false negative, gets tricky because its internal models are not the same as our internal models. So it's such a different model. How do we explain and predict the sorts of errors it can make? So as we understand the AI, we have to understand that this is a different sort of intelligence. So I want to talk about generative AI and the language effect. Language is a big deal. The cognitive fabric of our social and intellectual lives, the heart of our knowledge economy, how we build and share understanding, how we think, communicate, and persuade other humans and even identify as, as human. And when we think of language as just a sequence of tokens, contextually defined, we can start thinking about modeling its meaning. There are two big inventions, right? Two big underlying things that make large language models work. Word embeddings, and that sounds fancy to tell you what they are if you already know, and attention-based transformers, which is a form of learning, a form of neural network. So word embeddings. So words are not represented in large language models as simply letters. Like David, and I say, is, is David the same as David? Is D is a D, is an A is an A, and B is a B? No, it looks like it's the same. No, that's not how they're represented. They're represented as their context. They're represented as a statistical model of the other words that tend to occur around them in a body of text. And I'm going to show you what that means. An attention based transformer or deep learning um, uh, devices that learn how to predict the next word in the sequence. And they do that very efficiently. So this looks like a fancy diagram, but I'm gonna help, I'm gonna walk you through it. We have three words, wings, engine, and sky. That creates a context. We have some interesting words like goose, eagle, and bee. And instead of like representing eagle as those letters, I'm gonna represent them as how close they are to those other words. So eagle has high correlation with wings and sky, but low correlation with engine. B has a lower correlation with sky. You can imagine why. Because they know what they mean, but when you understand the language, the context, you get that. Jet, it's not showing there. I don't know if you can eliminate that thing over here. But jet is, is very hot. Like that's high correlation with sky, engine, and wind. So this is how we represent words. And now don't imagine we're representing the meaning of jet or eagle in the context of three words. Imagine we're representing the context of 100,000 words or more. And the more training data we have, the more tuned those numbers are. So this allows me to represent these things not as letters, but as their, their meaning in terms of context. I can even do math on them now. I can say jet minus wings comes up with a bunch of numbers when I decode it, it's rocking. Think about that. We're representing words, not as words, but as their meaning as represented in the context and the use of language. These are word events. Now, this is what the attention-based transformers do. They predict the next word or phrase. So if I have the great rising rates will, and they learn to, they learn when they look at a lot of data, which word to pay the most attention to. So in this case, great has a huge impact. It's going to reorder the probabilities of what appears next. So it will increase returns more. Versus at the bottom of the list is discouraged consumers. I change one word, the terrible rising rates will, and the probabilities flip. So now my best bet is discouraged consumers end, and my worst bet is increased returns. Where does that come from? Not understanding a causal model of how macroeconomic works. Uh, that comes from looking at what was written and making predictions on what the next, how the next word will follow. So that's how large language models work. Remarkably powerful what they do. I can do this in any domain using a great statin and then effectively manage my, my cholesterol. Using an awful statin causes severe muscle pain and fatigue. Right? This is, by the way, right out of GPT. I didn't make this up. Um, so we can do amazing things. We can craft language by just predicting the next word, feeding that in, and building these things. With massive amounts of data, these things do remarkable work. I do I sell coffee to people from like Denver, Alabama versus from San Francisco? Remarkable. What they're focused on. You could read it in, in the middle of the middle text there, right? Emphasize use of ingredients versus highly sustainable blah, blah, blah. These things are outperforming on professional exams. You can see from GPT 3.5 to 4, we're more than passing the LSATs, US Bar, Nursing Journal Board exam, US Medical License exam. And by using that idea that I just told you, you can also
you also have a conversation like this. Who founded elemental cognition? Elemental cognition was founded by Lord Murphy and David Dunn. Long was founded by David. My next question is who does David Bucci work in? David Bucci is the CEO and founder of elemental cognition. How do you, where's the holistic intelligence here? What's going on? When you think about how they work, you can start imagining why you're getting this behavior, right? Now I say, Dave Fruitch is indeed the founder of elemental cognition, and it apologizes for its previously wrong er error, and then I say, are you sure? And it says, I'm sorry, it's actually on its healing. So these things are a lot of incredible influence by the prompt and the training data, and they're completing the sentence based on those distributions, based on that, that particular model. I'll give you one more example. This is where it gets really, really powerful and at the same time kind of really scary, right? So this is, does this make sense? It seems to counter standard economic thinking. So this is a statement, you know, they're, you know, they're basically saying raising short-term rates um, to a low level will be conducive to economic growth. That's kind of counter to the use of when you raise rate chapters, it's practical growth. Um, so what's going on here? And what's fascinating is you get a very, very cogent response um, summarizing, you know, what was said, you know, summarizing the, the things like borrowing rates and potential for financial instability and so forth and so on. And then you get a statement if the economy is already operating near potential, higher interest rates could lead to inflationary pressures. That's just wrong. If you're not an expert, you don't know, this is what we call hallucination. Um, but in, that, in the first example, when we talk about me as the founder of elemental cognition, the hallucination was obvious, especially for me, because I know who it is. If I didn't know who it is, I wouldn't know who's who's saying. Here it's quite subtle. If you're not a little bit of an expert in economics, you'll be just saying, you know, I don't know what's going on. Right? This sounds really good to me. So, we, so one of the challenges we have, this incredibly powerful ability that can write essays, really cogent essays for us, is what's called hallucination, truthfulness, or correctness. Um, bias in training data and prompt. When you're finding statistical distribution, you're literally finding your bias. You're saying, what, how does the data skew to here versus how does it skew to there? Verify bill. Where's the evidence? And is it believable and why? Still bad, complex, precise, reliable, and consistent puzzles. All of that, this is a point in time. And this stuff is moving quickly and getting better and better. And people are doing really creative ways to do this. But you need to understand how it's evolving to effectively apply, apply it. And one of the other things we have to worry about, and this is more of a human thing than to think about the technology, is that when you produce cogent, clear language, there's assumed credibility. I don't look into it. I don't do the critical thinking. I don't do the fact checking because it's sounding so dark. And we have to understand that that's one of the challenges we have when you look at technology that's mastering, in some ways, mastering the efficiency of language. So I'm just going to sum up the things I worry about. I don't worry about AI, you know, using us as batteries, um, like the matrix, or you know, our children or whatever. But I do worry about um, centralized control and propaganda because of the incredible power of these things to build and sharing language. Systemic bias, just broadly understanding how the AI works. It's not doing all the reasoning based on value propositions. It's doing statistical inference. Security and privacy, impact on labor markets. There's so much you can do with this technology. It was coming early. It's happening. It's happening fast, clearly, right? Sometimes we talk about, you know, well, AI is not so good at, you know, making, you know, causal complex decisions. Neither are we. I mean, the reality is that's a hard problem. And so when we think about can AI replace jobs, there's going to be a shift in the job market, you know, clips and data. And of course, lowering the barrier for bad actors and deep fakes, because the ability to generate this stuff in, in remarkable ways, that's clearly going to be an issue. So those things I worry about. That's I did I do it? Close it up. <laughs> Thank you, David. He'll answer your questions for a fee. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, <clears throat> next, uh, there was a lot to unpack there. <laughs> I think you, you spoke about 30 minutes worth and there was uh, 12 minutes that you were up there. So uh, thankfully you, you speak fast. And also I just want to say thank, to the, thank you uh, to the co-chair of 
our AI task force, Dan Pinocchio, one of the things we had done was we wrote into the bill uh, to utilize cases, the Connecticut Academy of Scientists and Engineers. And it's, I feel like an underutilized asset by our legislature, and they have been so helpful uh, as an organization, uh, Carrie, but Nick personally as well has really stepped up and helped. Uh, helped me tremendously and helped to really get us to a lot of the speakers uh, for today. Um, and so, so with that, we'll go on to our uh, next speaker. And let me... So we're very fortunate uh, to have joined us again. Thanks, uh, to Nick Arvind Krishna, the CEO of IBM. Um, very sensitive, so I'll let him <laughs> go. But um, I don't want to take up any more of the time. Arvind has been very gracious uh, to speak to us, and he'll, he'll, I will let him take over. Arvin, you're on. Okay, thank you. So first, Senator Maroney, Representative De Gasterno, and Nick, thank you very much for allowing me to spend a few minutes with you and offer some of my thoughts. Look, I gotta begin first at a personal level. I'm honored to join you, not only in my capacity as CEO of IBM, but also as a proud resident of the state. I've been a a resident of Richfield, Connecticut for the last almost 20 years. And I can tell you that this is one of the first forums I'm speaking at where my daughter had the chance as a high school student to be a member of the Connecticut State Board of Education Advisors. And I'm coming in here five years, I think five years after her. So that is, that is intriguing and interesting to me. On a more serious note, I do commend your leadership in both assessing and regulating the use of leading edge technologies like AI by our state agencies and trying to understand its broader impact on job skills people. A, a statistic that I'll quote, AI could produce four and a half trillion dollars of productivity on a global level by 2030 on an annual basis. If you think about that, that's unlocking 5%. If you think about that impact on society, on the state, on economy, on competitiveness, I think there's very little else we can think of that can cause that much. Now, I want to motivate that a little bit by some examples. And by the way, it's always fun listening to David Ferrucci and his very deep understanding on this topic. But I want to go a little bit towards uh, how we can deploy these very powerful technologies. The first example I think of is in all the things we think of when we think contact centers, paperwork trails. In all of those areas, we think this will bring and unlock 30 to 50% more productivity. So as opposed to six months worth of a backlog at some agency, it could become a couple of days. By the way, those are real examples. We did some of that work with the Veterans Administration in processing pension and benefits for are United States veterans. A second example I really like is around the use of computer languages or code. It is going to be easy to see productivity expand. It is not going to reduce the number of programmers, and I'll come back to that. Instead, it will allow us to address the technical debt and to allow much more progress to happen. And a way to perhaps characterize it is that we are going to augment human workers by having digital workers alongside us, making us more productive, allowing us to focus on empathy, giving a much better experience to somebody on the other side. Okay, so all that being said, AI's rise has also been, uh, while accompanied by enthusiasm, there are a lot of fears around, is it going to displace people? Is it going to potentially harm us? Look, I would say, we should, uh, to use a phrase from one of my favorite authors, Tom Clancy, we should worry about the clear and present danger. Those are much more around misinformation, uh, disinformation, um, the hallucinations, which David just talked about. 
I think the aspects of it trying to take over, be autonomous, are really much more far-fetched and not within reach of what we have all collectively invented so far. So how do we start with? So I'll start first by talking about jobs. AI is going to create more jobs than it remotely displaces. This is very simple. Let's think about the internet. Back in 1995, when the internet first came on the horizon, people did worry about job displacement. We have had an increase in jobs. We didn't think about roles like web page designers, 5 million of them. We didn't think about people being able to buy and sell, uh, leveraging the internet technologies, maybe 10 million of them, or even what has been called piecemeal work enabled by some of these technologies. So always, while there could be some, there is going to be far more creation. The economic way of looking at that is, if there is an area that is more productive, it has historically caused more jobs, not less. Why? Because the entity, the state, the company that is more productive can normally offer a better product at a better price. That actually brings you more market share, and hence you actually are going to hire more people, not less. So that is why I think productivity is often misunderstood when you think about a time scale of a few years as opposed to a few weeks. The next thing I want to touch on is AI and the workforce. By and large, all surveys we do indicate that about 40% of the workforce will have to have some level of rescaling. This is not to say that they are going to become AI experts or they're going to become inventors of AI. The reskilling is going to be about leveraging and using AI in their daily work and in their daily lives. This is something that I believe almost every employee will have to learn, but they will not have to learn how to code AI systems. And this is the part about the workforce that we have to then think about how do we make them adept at this? Just like 30 years ago, we made them all adept at using computers as opposed to typewriters. So very, very similar and not a lot of, uh, I believe not a very high bar to climb, but there has to be a little bit of exposure to that. Now, if we also look at uh, low income families, they are much more likely to be able to up their earning capacity by leveraging these skills. So but the last topic I want to touch on is on skills. Look, as at IBM, we are committed to help build skills for these new uh, technologies and areas. And we have a long history of doing that, all the way from working with universities, working with students, working with our clients through the 60s, 70s, and 80s in teaching them computer skills. In 2021, we unveiled a commitment to help 30 million people get upskilled. And this goes across a variety all the way from working with university and faculty in helping them advance the curricula that they create. They're in control, they create it. We would like to offer help in both materials, skills, people to get there. K through 12 in bringing these down to people uh, in helping women return to the workforce when they have taken time out. Veterans, cyber skills, AI skills, and, um, and so on. So this is an area that we are committed to, and we would love to work with the state to go further there. My belief is there are three principles there that the state should look at. First, look at regulating risky use cases as opposed to the technology or the algorithms itself. We want innovation on the algorithms, but I agree that there should be guardrails on the use cases. Two, foster an open innovation ecosystem. Always, areas that have fostered open ecosystems tend to flourish and bring jobs and improvement in economy. Third, I believe it's okay to hold the inventors of AI models accountable for what they have created. So I'll just offer those as principles and then close that if you all work together on helping AI become uh, transformative and trusted, it is going to cause an economic boon that we can all take advantage of. With the overall demographics, and the overall backlog that is going to come up in services, 
AI offers a great way forward to help solve some of those problems, given what is going on in the overall economy and the demographics of the number of people and the number of people of working age that are going to be there. With that, um, I'll turn it back to all of you. I'm certainly open to be here for a couple of minutes if there are any questions or queries. If you don't mind, I'll ask a, a few questions of you before we move on uh, to our next session. So I think you already touched on it a, a little bit in your recommendations uh, for regulation, but I just, uh, you know, given the fact that the EU uh, finally, I think they passed the AI Act this week, it made it through the, the trilogues that have been finalized. And also, I believe in an interview last week, you had said we're in the first inning of the AI thing. Uh, so, given the fact that we're very early on, um, can you give specifics of how government should approach that? I know you mentioned looking at more at the riskier cases and then also recommendations on how we can maybe best partner with in industry and empathy. Yeah, uh, sort of great question and one I think about a lot. While acknowledging that on policy, all of you are far larger experts than I will ever be. So, I do want to uh, put that in. Look, uh, I use the first innings analogy because if you think about a baseball game, AI is in the first innings. So it's going to be hard to predict how the game plays out because by the fifth or sixth inning, you normally get a better sense, not in the first. But we're all on the field and playing. So with that, I would caution, when it's like this and you don't quite know how it'll evolve, regulation should have a light touch at the beginning. It should stop bad behavior, but allow innovation to flourish. And that is the tricky dribble because you don't want to leave it completely without guardrails, but you want to put some on, which is why I caution that maybe use cases as opposed to precise regulations, because we can't exactly predict how the technology itself evolves is one way to go. And also with digital technologies, it's tough to regulate them from within a physical boundary because you can access them elsewhere. So that's why my use cases, not technologies. And the second part on that is, if there are very risky things that are going to perhaps cause harm to human life, that's where I would always assert more. And the, that's where kind of Europe went with their risk-based uh, methodologies. So that's kind of what I would add maybe in color to the little bit of comments I made uh, in my opening remarks. Uh, thank you very much. And you mentioned your commitment to helping to reskill uh, uh, and, and to upscale, and I know uh, in the past I, I met with uh, representatives about having you know, a skills academy where you partner with community colleges and colleges uh, to help them develop curriculum. And you know, earlier on in the previous interview, and then earlier on today, you said uh, you know AI is going to help make us thirty. You know, I think you said thirty to fifty percent more efficient. Uh, so where do we start? Right? Given that you have free skills classes, uh, emphasis is here, they have you know, a free skills program wingspan. Where would you recommend that we tell our citizens to start learning in order to prepare themselves to yield those efficiency gains? Yeah, so one is the forum and the next is where. So I personally think that if I look at the state of Connecticut, I actually always believe that community colleges and local state colleges are the best place to learn by offering up classes that may run a few weeks or a few months in terms of learning how to leverage and deploy these technologies. That's kind of on the scaling piece where any task that tends to have a lot of repetitive work and that repetitive work we believe by observing, not by writing rules could be automated so wherever there is a backlog, wherever things are taking a month, could we step in and help leverage AI to automate and give our citizens a better experience? Is there some place where we are running out of capacity and so that is causing a backlog? Uh, I think as I think about those kinds of things, that is where I believe in the state one can deploy. Any place that ha happens to have a call center, a big set of uh, contact center uh, deployments, I think uh, is going to be 
one where you would deploy AI and get a much better experience for people on the other side. Look, we can see this happening in the insurance industry, which has certainly got a huge footprint in Hartford. This is going to happen. And by the way, it doesn't cause job displacement. The reason it doesn't, people can then focus on the more complicated cases and cases which need empathy, but then you can be happy that AI can answer the question at midnight as opposed to having to wait till 9 a.m. the next day. Thank you. I think that is an important point on uh, job displacement, right? I, I think that I was at a conference and they said that their thought is over the next five to 10 years, AI will cost 85 million jobs, it'll eliminate 85 million jobs, but it'll create 97. <laughs> and I think 60% of the jobs that we do now didn't exist in 1940, and we're just seeing such a rapid acceleration that probably in the next 10 to 20 years, 60% of the jobs we're doing wouldn't have existed uh, today. Now, I have one last question for you, if you're okay with that. And so there's a lot of talk about responsible AI and deploying AI responsibly. Can you talk to some of the government policies that I know and how you are deploying AI responsibly within, within your company? Yeah, so uh, one policy we do, so we everybody worries about how was the AI trained, where was it trained, what did you use to train it? And this is gonna become hard to predict, though I have a view um, in terms of whether it's copyright, is it plagiarism, what is it? So one governance policy we are following is that for our clients, we will hold, give them the same indemnity as we do for any other technology. So that's why I'm not saying, only copyright or only plagiarizing or only data, same uh, indemnity as we give for other technology. So that gives you a sense of our confidence that we are not going to get uh, uh, sued or taken to the courts for bad behavior. I would actually tell you that this should, this accountability should be extended to all people who create models. Two, there is a lot of technology under it. You got to run your test cases of, is it producing hate speech? Is it crawling into areas it shouldn't? Is it directly reproducing uh, data from the underlying? There's a long list of tests that you have to carry out uh, then to have confidence that you can do the things that I'm describing. There's other kinds of tests around bias, around the protected categories. If I remember right, I think there's 15 categories that we protect um, uh, here in the United States. You can do all those tests, and I believe that, that it, it is upon us to make sure that we carry those out. And finally, on the use cases, we run an AI ethics board inside, and we have to, before somebody brings a use case uh, to market, our internal board agrees that this fits our ethics as opposed to something that we don't want to do. So those are three concrete suggestions I would offer in terms of AI governance. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we have a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you for your talk and also thank you for choosing to live in Connecticut. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of money on people here. Yes. <laughs> uh, next, uh, we're going to have our panel. So if the panelists for the um, word board panel will come up here. And then, so do you want to moderate from sitting down? Or yeah, okay, great. Um, so uh, our panelists, uh, Monica Lockford from WorkKey, uh, Kelly Valieres, uh, the Chief Workforce Officer, and then uh, Trey Palsme, who is joining us uh, by Zoom. So, and then uh, Senator Dr. Saud Anbar will uh, take over and moderate this panel. He's been really at the, at the forefront of a lot of the health AI uses, and he's been working with uh, Scott Lowry. Scott will be moderating the next panel. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Roney. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, something that's quite important. I think a lot of people, when they talk about AI in the general public, when they have a conversation, um, the people who have the conversation in two broad categories when they're talking about this, they would say, well, is it going to complement the workers or is it going to replace the workers? And that's the question that everybody asks. So I mean, we will touch on this in our conversation, but also look at it from the lens of what are the concrete things from a policy perspective that can be looked at to address this. Um, 
So uh, what I will do is I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then we will have each one of them speak for about five minutes. And then subsequently we will have Q&A with a focus to try and have some concrete ways of addressing some of these aspects. Um, I, I, I will share some data, which uh, many of the people have been hearing in different ways, and that sort of uh, gives a perspective why this conversation is so critical. Um, according to some estimates, artificial intelligence will impact two-thirds of current jobs uh, with some form of automation. So any job that is automation, the majority of them would have some changes. And 30% uh, of all hours of work in workforce will be automated by the year 2030. So you heard 40% in another um, thing that Armin was saying. But I, I think these are the, the aspects that we have to have a discussion and a conversation about. So I will uh, introduce uh, Monica uh, also first. Uh, um, Monica, um, I will read a number of things about you. You've done some amazing work. You serve as a senior policy manager for Workday, a leading provider of enterprise cloud services, delivering financial management, human capital management, and analytics applications. Uh, in your role, uh, you lead the company's public policy initiatives uh, for the eastern 26 states of the U.S., uh, mainly engagement on AI laws and framework, and helping uh, it become a leading proponent for workable safeguards on high-risk AI. So that's going to be important, and uh, you've had the experience in public policy and advocacy at the local level, state level, and the federal level. You have a whole degree in political science and public policy from the University of California, Berkeley, and you live in Alexandria, Virginia, and thank you for being here this uh, afternoon. I will introduce our other speakers as well. I'll start with you, um, Kelly uh, Valeris, and, and uh, Kelly Valeris, uh, Dr. Valeris, is the Vice Chair of the Governor's the Workforce Council and the Chief Workforce Officer of the Office of Workforce Strategy. The Office of Workforce Strategy leads the implementation of the first data connected strategic workforce development plan. The business that, uh, plan requires the coordination, collaboration, and cooperation of multiple stakeholders, including workforce development boards, state agencies, education, economic, and community based organizations to build the systems, schemes, and approaches that will make Connecticut a talent environment that attracts and motivates students, career builders, and companies. Dr. Valeris is also an entrepreneur. She has served as the president and CEO for some 14 years before stepping down to thankfully help us in the state of Connecticut. Uh, you, uh, in a new role in the state of Connecticut, you uh, combine your roles in industry and education to carry out the mission of uh, uh, Governor's uh, Workforce uh, Council Strategic Plan. So welcome and thank you for being here. And our um, uh, third uh, panelist is Trey Halsey, who's uh, John joining us online. We see you there. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, uh, Ms. Halsey is um, head of uh, Responsible AI and Senior Director of Data Sciences at Indeed, uh, where he and his uh, team work to ensure Indeed's use of AI is beneficial to job seekers, employers, and society. Uh, and as author of Indeed's Responsible AI Strategy, he leads an interdisciplinary group of data scientists, engineers, and researchers in tackling the social technical issues of algorithmic, human, and systemic bias. Wow. He's also a member of Indeed's Environmental Social Govern Governance Leadership Team, uh, where he and his uh, colleagues are changing the way the world hires for good. Um, it's indeed a pleasure to have you here. And with that, I'm going to ask uh, Monica Lumber to go ahead, and you're on. Hey, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Monica Lumber, and I am a senior public policy manager at Workday. I manage our policy portfolio for the Eastern U.S. states. If you're unfamiliar with Workday, Workday is a leading provider of enterprise cloud applications for finance and human resources. Our software is used by more than 10,000 organizations around the world and across industries, including state of Yale University. In the state of Connecticut, we have 88 customers and over 31,000 employees in the Workday system. Globally, the Workday customer community includes 65 million users, and as of April this year, nearly one in four of all U.S. job openings was processed on the Workday platform. I want to thank Senator Maroney and Senator Anwar for bringing us together today for this important conversation about the impact that AI will have on its workforce. 
Workday is fully committed to maximizing AI's promise to unlock human potential, but we are also equally committed to the importance of smart AI safeguards. Our advocacy efforts focus on advancing both workable AI regulation that builds trust and supporting tools that help workers navigate the changing future of work. As with earlier advancements in technology, AI will impact how people work and the skills that their jobs require. Notable developments around generative AI are also accelerating the pace of transformation, but many companies are still focused on implementing this new technology and are in the early stages of harnessing its potential. At the same time, we are confident that AI can empower Connecticut's workers and employers to navigate these changes, mainly by providing the tools to take a skills-based approach to talent at scale. At Workday, we believe that the skills we believe that skills are the fundamental currency of the changing world of work, and a skills-based approach can give employers and workers the agility they need to respond to rapid changes in the economy. A shift to a skills-based approach in hiring puts an emphasis on what a candidate can do or learn rather than solely on their education-related credentials. This is particularly important in states like Connecticut, where, according to the Harvard Business Journal, 90% of residents over the age of 25 have at least a high school diploma, but only 42% have a bachelor's degree or higher. In fact, hiring for skills has been, been found to be five times more predictive of job performance than hiring for educational qualifications. Organizations that use skills-based practices are also twice as likely to play talent effectively and 98% more likely to retain high performers. This approach not only helps the job candidates, but incumbent workers and employers as well. First, it can help incumbent workers more nimbly upskill and reskill for new roles, including through on-the-job experience and data-driven career planning. Second, Employers can expand their applicant pools and shine a spotlight on talented individuals who are equipped to excel in jobs that might not fit a traditional candidate profile on paper. So where does AI come in? A skills-based approach to talent can be difficult to implement without the right technology. Skills data is notoriously voluminous, with the same term being used for different skills and various ways to refer to the same type of skills. When responsibly implemented, AI is ready made to process large amounts of data associated with occupational roles and responsibilities and develop so-called ontologies or vocabularies that make skills data actionable. One of our products, Skills Cloud, aligns skills to a common vocabulary by using machine learning to map how different skills relate to each other and evolve over time. Skills Cloud has actually been used over 40 million times both by hiring managers for new job postings and for incumbent workers who are looking to communicate the skills that they already have. Over 25% of Fortune 500 companies are now live on Skills Cloud, and workers at these companies have entered over 200 million skills into their profiles. The result is that Skills Cloud can help workers and job candidates better describe and represent the skills they have and determine what skills they need. It can help companies understand their workforce skill gaps, allowing them to more effectively match talent opportunity through tools like talent marketplaces and base workforce planning on their most important asset, their people. It can also provide for career hubs that take the guesswork out of career planning because workers are able to identify their next steps, find mentors, and seek out relevant learning opportunities, which all drives targeted reskilling for the incumbent workforce. And while we see incredible opportunities for AI to unlock human potential, we also recognize the risk of unintended consequences. Our guiding principle in AI product development, which is enshrined in our responsible AI program, is that AI should be used in a way that augments work rather than in displacing people. Our product development team has worked hard so that users can understand how and when AI is being used so that human is always informed and a final decision maker. We found that this approach builds trust with both our customers and our end users. Beyond our own products, Workday has also been a leading voice pushing for AI regulation that builds trust and supports innovation in the HR context since 2019. We are actively engaged in a number of conversations with state, at the federal level, and around the world, and we have developed model legislation that reflects our vision for robust and workable guardrails for high-risk AI. We're happy to share that model legislation with this group. I want to conclude by offering Workday as a resource to this task force. As you try to move forward on responsible AI and the future of work, we hope you will seek us out as a partner and as a sounding board. We are all in on AI's ability to support a skills-based approach to talent, 
But in order for this technology to deliver on its potential, safeguards are also needed. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Mr. Trey Cozy. Uh, Trey, you're on. Right. Thank you very much. And can you hear me okay? Uh, thumbs up from the panel. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to join this really important discussion. I'm really privileged to be here uh, with, with esteemed colleagues as well. Uh, I really appreciate the task force's ongoing efforts to really create a thoughtful approach to regulating AI and protecting consumers and job seekers against the potential harms and abuses uh, that you know they no doubt can face, as well as to facilitate innovation and growth. Um, so a little bit of background on Indeed and our approach and our and, and how uh, we're approaching these issues. Uh, so we are a, a global leading job site uh, where we develop responsible AI tools to help all people get jobs. Um, we are co-headquartered here in Connecticut uh, and over 590,000 Connecticut job seekers use Indeed uh, to find work and over 10,000 Connecticut businesses use Indeed uh, to find talent and hire those job seekers. Uh, we do have two offices in Stanford and employ nearly 1,000 people uh, within Connecticut. Uh, so at Indeed, as I said, our mission is to help all people get jobs and all of our technology solutions, policies and partnerships are seeking to empower both job seekers and employers to not only improve and speed up the hiring process, but also to reduce inequality and, and, and equity uh, in, the, in the hiring process. So with over 350 million monthly uh, unique job seekers visiting our site, we want to help eliminate biases as much as possible and ensure that everyone has access to quality work. Uh, so much so that we've publicly declared a commitment uh, to helping 30 million job seekers who face barriers uh, find a job by 2030. Uh, and AI is absolutely essential to making that happen and to solving these kinds of large scale uh, problems like employment and quality work. So thanks to AI right now, someone gets hired on Indeed every three seconds. Uh, as far as the labor market is concerned and for today's uh, kind of topics, I think there's really no bigger question, obviously, that we're facing than, you know, whether AI will create or destroy jobs. Like, yes, I think is the answer. Uh, it will both create and destroy jobs. Uh, and I think what form that will look like, how the economy may be reorganized, what potential areas of disruption are, and what potential areas of growth are. Uh, in September, economists at our hiring lab, uh, we did publish our first round of research on this very topic, uh, looking at which industries are more likely to be uh, disrupted or affected by generative AI, uh, things like ChatGPT and so on. Uh, we analyzed 2,600 skills from more than 55 million job listings uh, to assess the potential impact and ability of ChatGPT and other large language models to perform each task. Uh, so, you know, I think probably as you've been hearing uh, throughout, but, you know, worth kind of reiterating is that we do see that um, generative AI's impact is, is primarily on knowledge workers uh, right now, which is an unusual situation compared to previous uh, disruptions we've seen in technology, uh, where we've previously seen those disruptions take the form of manual labor and repetitive labor and so on. So uh, interesting there. We are also seeing that uh, jobs that employ large shares of younger workers, uh, including food preparation and service, have less exposure to generative AI, but as those workers age into their mid-career years, they're more likely to move into roles that will then require them uh, to either use generative AI or be exposed to generative AI or potentially be impacted by generative AI. Um, to my point earlier about equity and hiring, uh, we do see right now that women are slightly more likely to work in jobs that are uh, have more exposure to generative AI, uh, although the differences are small as of right now. And we do see some demographic dis uh, differences as well uh, over the dimensions of race and ethnicity. So Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders tend to be more represented in jobs with the highest potential exposure, though kind of unpacking that's a little bit of a word salad, but making sure that uh, we see that different groups are impacted differently. And of those groups, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders tend to be in jobs that are more likely to be impacted uh, by generative AI. And uh, Latin and Latinx workers are employed in occupations uh, with the least potential exposure. I think all of that is is things that we can weigh right now about bias and AI and how it will affect work. But I would also like to stress, like it's very early. Um, as our esteemed uh, as our esteemed panelist said earlier, we are in the first inning, I think, and making I think uh, overly confident claims about where the impact will be and and who will be impacted is 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 probably um, premature, is what I would say. And so we're approaching this with curiosity, looking to see what the data reveals, and making sure that we're pulling on the wealth of our data to to identify those trends. Um, as mentioned in the intro, I did uh, author our AI principles, which we have committed to publicly and how we are uh, using AI responsibly at Indeed. Uh, so in addition to 
uh, <coughs> excuse me, complying with existing laws and regulations and best practices. Um, we do have five principles that we've released. Uh, the first of which is shared with our broader business and that we are job seeker first. Our mission is to help people get jobs and we're committed to creating access to opportunity and making sure that that is uh, as fair as possible and helps as many people as possible. Similarly, we are centering fairness and equity in our use of AI, making sure that we are not uh, creating systems where uh, people, who, the haves are getting more and the have nots are getting less and making sure that we are continuing to expose opportunity for individuals. We are committed to listening and learning. Um, as I said before, this is early days. Uh, we don't claim to have this figured out completely yet. We think we are moving in the right direction, but we are eager to learn from our colleagues. Uh, actually, we've collaborated with Verte uh, on the future privacy forum principles as well. And so we are committed to kind of identifying those best practices across industry. Uh, and our last two is, uh, first, we fundamentally believe that hiring is human. Um, while AI is necessary to create opportunity and generate those matches between employers and job seekers at the scale that we're talking about, the actual act of finding a job, of hiring someone for a job, of finding a new job, those are extremely human processes. And what we would like to do is make sure that we are creating tools that enable you to get to those human elements as quickly as possible and to spend more time in that phase of the hiring process. So having that conversation with the hiring manager, talking to your future colleagues, figuring out if, if this is the job that you really want to take, those are not things that an AI system can do for you. And we're not seeking to create AI systems that will do those things for you. Um, and so finally, our, our kind of blanket principle is, is innovating responsibly. And so that infuses what we do. We do a lot of internal uh, training as well, but we recognize that there is a lot of work to do with this generation and the next generation of workers, thinking through the implications of these systems, thinking through how these systems might impact people's lives and training people to prepare uh, our CEO, Chris Himes, has has floated the idea of potentially a, a form of a Hippocratic Oath for people that work on AI or something similar to commit to a common set of ethics that the industry can agree on. Um, finally, uh, cognizant of time, I'll just briefly touch on uh, our approach to regulation. And I want to echo that we have been early and uh, often advocating for effective regulation in this space and uh, taking a risk-based approach uh, here as well. And so we think that any approach to regulating AI should really protect and empower vulnerable and marginal populations. It should encourage responsible innovation and competition, and importantly, be flexible enough to address, I mean, to say a rapidly changing landscape is, is kind of an understatement, uh, you know, to, to address like what's kind of going on in the industry as we watch. And, and I think, you know, as we build on top of an existing framework of regulations and laws. And I think all of us here, like working in the employment states, it's already a highly regulated space. There's an existing body of case law and regulation to, to build upon, making sure that we're bringing coherence kind of across both new regulations and old regulations. Uh, we were, as I mentioned, very pleased to join the Future of Privacy Forum uh, with Workday, LinkedIn, and ADP in releasing our best practices for AI and workplace assessment. Uh, I, I think the opportunities here are huge and aligning across industry on how we're going to use these technologies in this space is really quite uh, imperative. And I'm very heartened to see how eager our colleagues at Workday and, and LinkedIn and ADP have, have been to join that conversation. Um, so just kind of and briefly, the three buckets that we, we have released here is we believe strongly in the role of human involvement in the development and use of AI systems. Um, so, you know, very exciting, but we obviously need to keep humans involved to keep consequential impacts uh, limited and uh, discoverable. Uh, we believe in consistent standards for governance, uh, and that could be internal standards uh, in addition to external standards. Uh, and so really aligning on those, finding ways to implement those internally with enforcement mechanisms, agreed upon governance structures, soliciting external feedback, on best practices from our partners in academia and the nonprofit sector, as well as in government. And we really would like to see, I think, um, as much as possible as standards emerging here, because I think right now what we struggle with is really kind of a patchwork of standards across various jurisdictions, legislatures. And I'm so thankful that people such as yourselves here in Connecticut are, are taking steps to address this as well. Finally, we believe in transparency and protection. Users should understand uh, that they are using AI systems. They should understand how those AI systems affect their potential opportunities uh, that they are being uh, exposed to as well. We need to protect individuals' personal data, make sure that data is controlled. Uh, and at the same time, we need to make sure that we are, in doing so, uh, protecting proprietary information 
uh, as well when we are uh, involved in being transparent. So it's a delicate balance, obviously, in balancing transparency and proprietary information. I think uh, job seekers deserve to know as much as possible about the systems with which they're interacting, and, and we are committed to that as well. Uh, so we look forward to uh, working with, with Senator Maroney, all the members of this task force, uh, my esteemed colleagues on this panel, on the development of some responsible AI policy, and really appreciate the opportunity to uh, deliver our perspective as both a deployer and a developer of AI systems, uh, hopefully a thoughtful leader in labor market insights. And I'm really looking forward to a lively discussion today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then our final um, panelist is uh, Dr. Ellie Valeris. You're on. Great. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Senator Maroney. Thank you, Senator Mark, for inviting me here today. Um, and for uh, establishing the Office of Workforce Strategy. So Connecticut is one of the first states to have an office that focused specifically on workforce development strategies and implementing a statewide strategic plan. The Governor's Workforce Council, which a uh, member of Indeed sits on our Governor's Workforce Council, so thank you guys for uh, the, the continuous support and conversations uh, around workforce in Connecticut. We need a lot of uh, our partnership with you for a lot of data information and other things. Um, but our office is established to um, keep up to date and implement the state's first strategic workforce development plan. That plan is based on three strategic pillars, two foundational pillars, and an overall understanding of how we align our very desperate workforce system here in Connecticut. So our, our strategic pillars are one, addressing the long-term effects of workforce development, uh, creating work-based work or career uh, pathway programs, um, staying from ensuring young students get exposure, then exploration in middle grades, and then opportunities for robust career pathways that include dual credit, dual enrollment, opportunities to earn industry recognized credentials and associate's degrees while still in high school. Uh, this is important to ensure that we have the uh, workforce of the next generation um, and establishing to understand how those next uh, technologies are gonna be needed to be developed younger and younger in, this, in the students that we have going through our education health system today. Secondly, we're looking at the short-term immediate needs of the um, workforce in Connecticut. So we're developing short-term job training programs um, that meet the specific needs of employers today and that upskill and reskill people into those next levels of um, careers and build them on career pathways. Um, most foundationally, the strategic plan is based on employer information and employer demand. So we've built regional sector partnerships across the state. We have 11 currently. We'll be adding to those as they, they grow organically within a region, but really looking at how does our workforce system meet the needs of industry today and that they are leading the conversation and forming the development of curriculum and uh, industry recognized credentials, and also being part of that robust conversation around skills based hiring. So, those are strategic um, pillars of our plan, but they're really couched in understanding uh, data and being data driven. So, understanding you know, what programs are working well, have the best outcomes, how do we expand and grow those programs, what's missing and within the system and how do we address that. And then very foundationally, uh, we're very focused on diversity, equity, inclusion, and helping people uh, with access into the workforce system. Um, so in order to do that, we have a chief diversity officer that um, works in our office and engages very robustly with um, community members across the state and really focuses our work on uh, the underserved populations here in Connecticut, making sure we provide access and equitable opportunities for them to engage in workforce development. So when we look at the overall state of, kind of Connecticut's unemployment and employment needs is we are at a historical uh, low of unemployment. So our unemployment rate is about 3.4%, a little less than the national average. We almost consider that a zero uh, percent of, of unemployment. We look at our labor market participation rate, which is around 67%. This 
participation rate includes those who are not old enough to work yet and those who are um, retired and out of the workforce. But we really look at a population of people who are just sitting on the sideline. And although our, our labor market participation rate is high um, compared to the national average, when we start to peel away those numbers, it's really our underserved population who are disproportionately sitting on the sidelines. So having more open jobs than we have people who are looking for jobs currently, we have about a 30,000 person gap of open positions. Historically, we have around 64,000 open positions. This is kind of on the average that is accounts for the churn of people leaving one job and getting another job. But that delta between the you know uh, 90 to 100,000 open positions is really what our office is focused on. And when we start to look at you know what are those jobs and what are the people that are available either who are looking for a job or on the sidelines, um, what is the mismatch? And we're seeing a huge skills mismatch. So those who are sitting on the sidelines and underemployed are low and skilled workers. Some of them have issues such as basic skills deficiencies in reading and math. Others have computer um, digital literacy issues. Um, and others just need the opportunity to understand what the skills that they have are and how those apply to open positions. So a lot of our work is really around trying to figure out all the pieces to this puzzle and build out pathways through our partnerships to address onboarding people, um, figuring out where they're at, what their current skills are, what that gap is, providing opportunities to reskill and upskill them, and then making sure, more, most importantly, that our employers are really in the, the beginning of the process. They're not at the end, like, I think I'll hire that person because they got this job training program, but they've been involved in informing what the training program or the educational program should be. They're committing to providing robust work-based learning experiences uh, to help people get the experience they need to be able to get that job they need at the end. We put a lot of artificial barriers in the way of helping people get to the jobs and the career ladders that are appropriate for them. And skills-based hiring is the key to really unlocking the opportunity that people have and the potential that they have. So, you know, we look at the number of students that graduate each year in Connecticut who are looking for employment after graduation. It's about 48,000. So when we think about that 30 to 40,000 delta that we have, we could fix that in one cycle of education. But the problem is our education doesn't always align to the needs, and that includes in higher ed on occasion. Um, so a couple of the programs that we are doing, um, one is uh, utilizing AI. Until this conversation today, I didn't really realize how important this work is, but in the portal that we have created is a uh, one-stop portal for enrolling in short-term job training programs. Part of that process is to help people understand what their current skills are, and we're using an AI tool there. They can either upload a resume and it will pull their skills out, or they can, they can load it right in and say, these are the jobs that I've done, the hobbies that I've had, and it will create uh, for them a category of their skills, and then it will, from then, look at the job openings that we have in the training programs to fill those jobs and help match them with the best pathways for them based on their skills, of their interests, and then inform them of what those next steps are. Now, again, that can't be the only component of the support that we give people. That's first step. The second step is making sure that we're building a robust opportunity to engage with career counselors and, and academic counselors so that they can really understand, well, what does all of this mean to me? And what does that opportunity create for me, not only in uh, current job positions and open career ladders, but what do I want to build for my skill set for the future to grow within those career ladders? So that component of the work that we do is really important to be able to look at those who are sitting on the sidelines, those who are underskilled and underemployed, 
and help them determine the best way to get into those career positions and career ladders. And then working with our employers, and you've got to remove those barriers from your human resources policy, such as a degree or a credential and X number of years of experience, because that is really cutting out a whole pattern, uh, population here in Connecticut and across the country. So as we um, work to enhance the opportunities that we have, you know, we have these short-term job training programs that rely on IBM short-term credentials um, for technology. Um, we look at technology as something that is really almost industry sector agnostic, right? We have it in a technology sector, but almost every job or every industry has technology jobs embedded in them. And so how do we start working with our companies that are outside, technically outside of the tech industry and have them start to think about themselves as technology companies and how do they then uh, look at the work that they have to do and the skill sets that they need for people to come into those jobs and build those career ladders. And then how do we build out those education and training programs that match those needs? So just a few quick things that we've done is the Tech Talent Accelerator, which is a great way for we have businesses working with an intermediary to build out credit in a higher education institutions. We've got now 12 academic universities in Connecticut working on this. So these are some of the things that we're doing within our office to address the workforce shortage and how AI can help us get there. Thank you so much. What we're going to do is um, we'll have rapid fire questions and you can answer fast. We have came goes with a lot of different aspects. If, if in front of us there was a uh, um, high school student or a college student and you also on the sideline had a principal and, and, a, and a community college uh, president, um, would the, what's the ground reality and what's going to happen to the, the jobs in future? Um, what recommendation are we going to give them? Three things each. This is for a academic institute. Academic institute, but also the student is the central. The, the high school and college students say, I, I want to do the same thing that everybody else who is going to be replaced. We don't want them to go in the direction where they would get replaced. So for me, I think it's those essential cognitive skill development, those um, durable skills, such as critical thinking, problem solving, effective communication. We need to build those skill sets because technology and the jobs that are going to be bringing in the future are going to change. So those lifelong learning skills to be able to learn a new technology and then learn the next new technology to keep up with the changing pace of economy. Yeah, I, I think, and I know this is a little bit of a, a non-answer, but the real answer is that we don't know right now. And and as much as 85% of jobs in 2030 are are yet to be created. So it's hard for us to say this is what you need to do in order to be successful in the future. I think that being said, that's why we continue to look at skills data and skills data hiring, because with skills data hiring, employers can expand their applicant pool to include people that would be but traditional profiles um, on paper, but also with skills data, we're able to identify where skills gaps are so that people can seek out those skills and be found um, position in them. Um, I would second my colleagues that when we look at skills in our system that um, are, are needed for a uh, majority of jobs, um, we're looking at soft skills um, like strategic planning and problem solving, and then some harder skills like computer literacy. Um. Sure, I think you know great points have been made so far, but I would I would really double down on the core cognitive, you know, logical thinking, uh, reasoning, writing. Uh, all of those are going to can always be uh, relevant. I mean, I think right now, like you know, evaluating whether uh, a generative AI model is hallucinating or whether you can trust its output, like. That, that that may, you know, end up being a solved problem in the future, uh, I don't think anytime soon, but like being able to critically evaluate information, synthesize that information, and then use it in ways that are relevant to your, your colleagues and, and others, uh, that will always be a valuable skill. In a lot of ways, like, you know, college, major, college majors and things like that are always kind of lagging indicators of where the economy is right now anyway, because I think, you know, you have to predict four years in the future at, at a minimum, but I think that uh, s focusing on skills is is exactly right, but I would add on top of that, like, and not just 
how to build AI systems or not just the computer science skills to use those AI systems. It's how to work in a job that will likely require tools that are powered by generative AI, but may not be the core part of your responsibilities either. So I think it's it's difficult to predict, but you can't go wrong being a critical thinker and, and responsible consumer of information. This is very helpful. So, so I'm just going to uh, say that when we are applying for jobs, it's skill-based jobs, but the job, the, the skills that you've talked about are not necessarily considered something that's marketable the way the computer is looking at them today. And that makes it a little challenging how do we navigate that. So if somebody's going to have critical thinking, they're going to have empathy, understanding, and then go deeper into it. How does, because the computer skill-based job search is not going to look at that the way it should be. Any thoughts on that? I think that's where AI comes in, right? So, you know, one person might say, I have spokesperson experience, and one person might say, I'm great at public speaking, and the AI is going to be able to make sense of all of that. And they're going to be able to say, okay, well, you might not have used the exact word that the job description uses, you would still have the skill and be a great fit for this position. So I think that for us is, is why still is hiring with AI. Uh, so they go in the end and, and how they can improve opportunities for people. Um, so I'll just ask you another question. So, so if we were to look at um, automation of the workforce, and that's the one that is going to be impacted unlikely the most. And then if you start to look at the demographics of the automated workforce that is existing today in 2020 in Connecticut, you will see that it's more women, it's more minorities. So this is also the group that also traditionally has not had the same level of financial benefits from the jobs that uh, are there to begin with. So now, with the machines coming in, they are going to be the ones who are going to be affected more at this point. So how do we navigate that from a policy perspective? I think that's great. Um, I think, you know, when we look at what we're teaching and how we're teaching in our school system, it's very antiquated, right? It's really based on, you know, book knowledge and not really the integration and the use of technology and the development of those critical thinking, problem solving, situational awareness skills that we talked about earlier, it's still more focused on that content knowledge. And so how do we shift um, the requirements of what happens in school, right, to develop that next set of generation of thinkers and lifelong learners, which is very different from being able to pass a history test and remembering the dates um, and the names of battles, but what was the situation that caused that uh, issue to happen and how did we learn from that? How did that affect history in the future? That's gonna be in, uh, instrumental in understanding that we have to make this shift in thinking about education differently and then for those who are kind of outside of the academic um, system currently from age, um, is how do we develop those skill sets in them, whether it's on a job training or within these short-term reskilling programs? But experience is core to that. So we can we can tell someone something, but until they actually experience it and understand how to de decode those experiences and what they mean to their learning. Um, that's where really where we need to start to get to when we start thinking about our education system and, and work based learning experiences and how vital they are. What we tend to do a lot of times is reward the highest performing students with the opportunity for work based learning or career pathway programs, where it's really the students who are underserved and maybe partially disconnected or disengaged that would benefit most from those opportunities. And we would see the biggest uh, jump in their ability to really. Fully participate in the workforce. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I'm so sorry. I, I thought that was a fantastic answer. I just wanted to add, you know, maybe one comment on top, which is we have to do a better job. And I think there's a lot of space and policy to incentivize this of, of expanding the groups and, and people of who are building these systems, who are working on AI. If you look around industry of kind of who is building most of generative AI systems, like it's a fairly homogenous group, both in terms of where they went to school, where they live in the country, where they, you know, kind of, you know, their socioeconomic status, their their ethnicity in many cases, like it is a very homogenous group in many cases. And I think uh, we're, we're making strides and in, in making it a more inclusive industry. But until you have representation across 
many different axes in terms of building these systems, you're going to continue to see uh, the developers not knowing what they don't know in many ways, right? Like if, if you don't have underrepresented people working on these systems, like they don't know to your point that these systems traditionally have not served very well uh, members of underrepresented groups and so on. And so to avoid continuing to make those mistakes, like education is a component of it, how we hire is a component of it, how we think about pipelines of individuals that go into tech is a component of it and like who is working on these systems. So I think all of those things are different levels of, of, of difficulty, but all necessary to, to tackle this. So I'll ask another question. So I'll, I'll go a little bit more deeper into this. In, in, in what I've heard in, in, in the world right now, and in, in perhaps even in Connecticut, is that people look at the date of birth of an individual to start to get an idea, even though it's illegal, to find out what the age of the person who's applying for a job is. They're trying to look at their gender. They're trying to look at the, their race uh, or which part of the state that they live in. All of those things which are nothing to do with the skill in, in making some of the decisions. So, so the thousand people apply, the one, the 30 who make it to the interview, um, there are so many factors that we don't understand or not know how they, the 900 some are eliminated. That's the scary part because now there's a risk that you'll say, oh, the machine did it, it wasn't me. And how do we protect our citizens from that? I think what it really comes down to, and one of the core principles that we were saying at Champion, and I know he has been a champion of this as well, is transparency. It's really important that you're clear about how our models are developed, um, what information they're trained on, um, and any potential biases are evaluated um, at the get go. And in terms of you know policy, because I know that's where we're trying to get today. One of the things we propose and, and put forward as a benchmark of any policy proposal that we support is this idea of the state roles. And so um, the developer in a in a AI system has a different role than the uh, employer of an AI system. Um, and part of that is because there's not as much transparency between you know how a system is developed versus how it's ultimately used downstream. And so there needs to be both transparency for the opposite users of the system, but also um, you know different responsibilities because the system is is utilized in different ways. So I'm just going to say uh, I'll use the example for indeed just for the sake of a conversation. So I say indeed, what are you guys doing to make sure we protect this? So why are we are transparent? We are not doing this. Is there a way for somebody in the state to check what those algorithms look like, what those things are, and what kind of skills do we need as a, as a non-computer uh, focused uh, person? What what are the skills that would need to be able to truly check if those computer algorithms are appropriate? That's a great question. Uh, so thankfully, I think there are ways, uh, and we're uh, hopefully my team is working on some of those, uh, which is we you know we do. For, for for on the transparency side, I just want to try to like we do quantitatively evaluate our systems using demographic data and others to evaluate if those systems are treating job seekers fairly. And I would add that like just because the machine did it doesn't ex absolve people from responsibility, right? Like that the the difference between disparate treatment and disparate outcomes is well established in kind of uh, anti discrimination law, and equally true I think for algorithmic systems. Like a, a process that looks neutral still can't produce um, you know unfair outcomes uh, under under our current laws. But I think as far as like a consumer of these systems, like a I think what you need to do is you need to look for disclosures on on the, the sites that you're using uh, to see if there is an opt out is one thing that people are discussing. Is there a way to get an explanation of the decision. This is something that the finance industry has used for a while of being able to generate explanations for why a decision was made. I think um, looking for proactive disclosures uh, beyond kind of terms of service is, is another one. And then there's a number of kind of proposed regulations across the country that have considered, you know, kind of yearly disclosures or how they've evaluated. I think um, if you are working with a vendor uh, who is proposing to use uh, algorithms, it's always good to look through uh, how their systems work. But I think fundamentally, you know, I, I say this not to be like glib, it's like, we also don't know why people make these decisions a lot of the time. And so like a lot of the times we're saying, you know, we would like to be able to have uh, full explainability and transparency uh, behind what this, this ML system or AI system has done. But in many ways, uh, when people do that, 
uh, you know, if you look at kind of cognitive neuroscience and things like that, they kind of create these explanations for why they made a decision after the fact, even if that wasn't actually their thinking of what they were thinking when they were making the decision. And so actually, I think a big benefit of some of these systems is the ability to reproduce decisions, is the ability to evaluate the range of outcomes that they're producing, kind of in a look back fashion to say, is this what we would have expected if this were, were operating fairly? So I think at the individual level, it's very difficult to know, yes, this system is working for my specific case in a specific way. But I think we can evaluate these systems kind of in the aggregate in a way that we can't really with humans sometimes. Okay, thanks, Ron. Yeah. Uh, I, I think this is just a really good opportunity, and I'm glad I didn't say it, to plug in practice assessments, which is one of the tools that we promote in the FDF practices that we collaborated on with the and then NADP. Um, and the thing about impact assessments is that they are a a, a concept that they're can zero in on on any risk and help mitigate it um, ahead of time. And so uh, impact assessments also have important advantages over other AI accountability tools in that they're familiar to a lot of organizations already and um, they're used quite frequently in the data privacy context. Um, they're practical because they don't rely on technical standards right now in the industry. There aren't a lot of clear-cut standards around how to mitigate bias or risk. Um, and impact assessments are, are one of the most widely agreed upon routes. And then they're future-proof because they can adapt as AI systems and AI governance to adapt going forward. Thank you. Um, another thing is that Unfortunately, in some, a certain group, a certain percentage of people will uh, lose their jobs. And, and so uh, talk to us about reskilling and how can that be instituted? How can the policies be made knowing that there's an opportunity? And then in the, in the same context, some people are capable of getting reskilled and some people are not, depending on their life and its personalities and so on. Um, what are the social services and things that can be created and are there models or some states are ahead of the curve in doing something right there? So I like to think that Connecticut is on the cutting edge of this. So the $70 million investment that the General Assembly and the governor uh, put in place, which we call Career Connect, is an investment in short-term job training programs. And what's really um, special about this program is that we have the opportunity to understand what are people's barriers to entry into these programs, and then how do we remove those barriers for them. Um, so these funds not only are utilized for the technical job training program that we're using, but also more importantly, helping people to um, overcome the barriers to entry, like providing for funding for transportation, childcare, housing, uh, access to technology. Uh, we also ensure that we're addressing basic skills deficiencies. So if they need additional supports for reading, uh, math, and uh, visual literacy, we can provide those as well. Some of our federal funding streams get very uh, tight on eligibilities. And so we dis, um, we, we can't serve everybody that we, we need to, such as the federal VOA dollars um, allow for basic skills remediation for those who do not have high school diploma. Um, but we know that the a vast majority of those who are sitting on the sidelines may have a high school diploma or an equivalent and are still basic skills deficient. So having these additional funds that really can be focused on helping people overcome some of those really basic needs. Um, and then ensuring that we, we build employability skills um, into those. How do you overcome like flat tire, whether it's a technically you got a flat tire or your car broke down or something else happens with the barrier, how do you overcome that? Those skills when we talk to employers are almost more important than the skills that they learn in the technical job training. Right, because those skills employers can, can typically upskill and skill people into how to do a machining job or to um, do some basic help desk uh, application on a computer, um, whereas the employers really can't teach those employability skills that really have those cognitive skills and help them overcome those barriers. Thank you. 
Thank you. Others want to weigh in what are the programs in other states? Uh, if interesting, and, and if the people cannot be reskilled, what do we do? I'm, I'm uh, this may sound uh, counterintuitive. I'm actually very bullish on the role of AI here. Um, I think in the past, what we've seen with reskilling is that it's very difficult to get reskilling resources, expertise, et cetera, to the places where people have been disrupted the most. And you kind of have this uh, chicken and egg problem where there is funding for reskilling, but deploying that funding is difficult or challenging or requires further disruption. And I think what we're on the cusp of right now with a lot of AI is highly customizable, highly bespoke, specialized education at an individual level that we can provide people. So think about like, I, I, I need to find a new field of work. Can you please AI, LLM, create a syllabus for me of skills I need to acquire, generate uh, a learning plan for me, create interview questions that I can practice with to think about how I would take a skills assessment in those. And these are the kinds of things that have been available to people with the means to hire a career coach in the past that have never been available to people who don't have those means. And so I don't, you know, I don't want to sit here and tell you that it's going to be amazing and, and no one is going to lose their jobs and everyone's going to have an AI tutor that, that solves everything. But I do think this is a unique technology that we can use the very technology that's disrupting to help ameliorate some of the concerns that are created by it. I love that answer too. Yeah, thank you for that. So, if, if people lose a long job, go to AI and, and upskill yourself and be better prepared. Do um, you have anything else? I have one. Go to the go to the next question. I just wanted to quickly add you know, the being able to utilize these tools uh, independently is, is vital, but also vital is to ensure that you actually have a real person who's supporting and helping you because if the challenge is too much for your skill set, then you'll disengage. So you need someone to help you overcome those barriers as you move through the AI process. But I agree that it'd be a main tool. Uh, and I'll, I'll 100%. Ask, and I'll ask this question. Uh, you guys have answered this in different ways earlier, but um, what are the potential harms in your industry from the algorithmic biases and what policies can we work on to try and minimize or eliminate those? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I, I think first and foremost, we want to look at it from a risk-based perspective. So is the risk going to create bias or is the risk, you know, that it changes the way that we do something? Um, and so for us, when we think about policy, that's the, one of the first things that we think about um, is, is looking at it in context and, and understanding the risk. But I think it would be really hard for me to sit here and say the risks are A, B, C, and D because AI yeah, can be used in so many different contexts. And ultimately, it really comes down to the context and context matters. And I don't want to say context anymore. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the obvious risks are the ones that are in front of us right now are kind of the known knowns, you know, bias, discrimination, uh, the kind of gains from any from AI accruing to the same people uh, who were already ahead uh, before and, and kind of not not seeing any um, closing of inequality gaps or anything. I think those are all kind of known knowns. I do really like the idea, though, that like we know there are going to be more uh, and, you know, it's and we're going to have to create policy, you know, for this audience that is able to anticipate them without being being overly uh, confident in its predictions, you know? And so I think uh, building on existing employment law, building on existing discrimination, providing ways to do impact assessments and quantitative evaluations of these systems to ensure that they are the outputs of these systems are operating fairly. Um, I also like, I, you know, I worry about, uh, to, to, to Kelly's point earlier, about not only, you know, like access to these systems, like how you learn how to interact with generative AI systems, because like that in itself is a skill uh, that you will need to then kind of be successful in the economy going forward. So even if you're not going to work on AI or with AI, like you're going to work on a job that has something that AI is helping you with or is powering or is making decisions. And so even knowing how to interact with these systems, I think is a danger in terms of kind of a, you know, knowledge inequality that then turns into socioeconomic inequality as well. I, I just want to add in that, you know, I'm not on the science side of this and the algorithm side, but we do have an opportunity to level the playing field here. I think if we bring in enough people with that diversity that you were mentioning is kind of lacking right now to contribute to the information that AI pulls out of, could we potentially create a more equal playing field where AI is not looking at 
gender, race, or socioeconomic status, but they're looking at who you are from the skill perspective um, and that making those matches and kind of maybe removing some of the things that you were talking about earlier based on age and race um, from the equation because we teach it not to look at those things as part of the information that it pulls to make those matches. This is the moment I wanted to go up higher up in my neural network with you, uh, Senator Maroney. If any question I have not asked in the last one or two minutes, you can address that. You have covered most of the issues and from a policy perspective, I think we talked about. Yeah, so I think, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you uh, to all of our panelists. We could just give them a round of applause. <laughs> I think you touched on a lot of important points. Uh, first, you know, I want to thank Indeed. Indeed has been a, a great partner. We're fortunate uh, to have them here in Connecticut. Um, and they have run a report for us all the skills that are in their front engineering jobs and other skills reports for us to help us guide creating those uh, certificate programs. I think um, it, it's important to, that we consider it right we're in the first inning, right? And, and we need to be very intentional about our training programs. You mentioned the lack of diversity in the workforce that's creating the system. I think it's only a quarter of the tech workforce now is women. And if you go to African-American women, it's only 2% of the tech workforce. And so that unknown unknown is trying to be more intentional about the training programs. How do we reach out and make sure that everyone is benefiting? Um, there's a survey that hasn't been published yet that is going to be coming out. They surveyed 7,000 people in Connecticut um, about their connectivity. And uh, I think it's 27% of residents lack basic connectivity. So how are we gonna retrain people when we're, uh, if, if, if with online academies and other ways, if they can't connect to the internet? Or a lot of people, especially when they're looking at disadvantaged people, they connect to the internet to their phone. So how can you do a training course on your phone, right? It's not the same as it, we may, it may come down to providing laptops, providing wireless hotspots so that people can access the internet. Uh, Kelly also referred to digital literacy. That survey is going to show 37% of people surveyed will fail basic digital literacy benchmarks. So, how can we, again, it's not necessarily reskilling, right? How can we educate people who aren't fully benefiting right now? Um, I think one of the things that you, is, I think all of our panelists pointed to, uh, with the potential of using AI to identify skills. Um, and, you know, we're at Yale, we go back to 1967, came in Brewster in his famous letter to the Yale admissions office. Um, he said, you know, when you're looking at disadvantaged populations, traditional measures of success are not, right? And so we can't just look anymore at where you went to school, if you got how, what your test scores were or other things, because we know that those are impacted um, by your income, your access to technology. So we're trying to find what is your potential? And AI may have that ability to identify and unlock that potential. So I think this has been a fantastic discussion. And thank you all. Um, we will continue this discussion as part of, we are going to break out into round tables. One of them will be focused on workforce. And so uh, we'll have more people and that will be in a separate room. Um, so we will uh, continue that conversation in a little bit. So uh, if you have any ideas or questions, put a pin in them and we'll hopefully get back to them later. But again, thank you to our panelists. I also want to uh, take a moment to acknowledge we have a lot of legislators who are here, um, as well as myself and Senator Anwar, uh, Representative Tegliano is here, uh, Senator Huang is here, Representative Bon Gardner, uh, is here. Um, and so I want to thank them for being here for their work. And just, it's a bipartisan group. We are committed to getting this done together. I, I think it is the important thing. We're early on. Uh, one saying I like is alone, you can go fast together, you go far. We have a long way to go, and that's why we need this has to be bipartisan. It has to be academia, industry, government uh, working together. Um, so with that, we are going to take uh, a 15 minute break. So I would encourage you uh, to go out. There are snacks, the cup is probably cold. I'll let you know I need a cup, so I'll wait to drink it if it's cold. Uh, but out there, we do have a, a number of companies who have set up. So the R sign is 
a Connecticut company that's using virtual reality for doing training. So you can check out, um, they're doing CNA training and other trainings using their technology. Um, Adara is here, and you can check out their technology where they are using Alexa to work with doctors and also to analyze the way doctors are interacting with patients. Uh, Infosys uh, has set up about their foundation. They have some free training programs that we can all uh, take advantage of, so I would encourage you to go there, as well as uh, Easy, uh, Rock by Tuck from Easy, you met him at the uh, New Haven, uh, Greater New Haven Chamber at Adam Reynolds' table on AI a few weeks ago, and he will be on our workforce uh, panel, but this company is just playing out there as well. So we will be back in this room in 15 minutes for the health tech uh, conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. I am very scared. Thanks to the partner of the partner.
Um, yes, yeah, we'll have all the other Cool. Thank you. How are you? Good. Hi. Good to see you. Yeah. Well, see you. Thank you. So, Hi. Uh, oh. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so, we would be missing. She's on to Sam. She's at. She's on to So. Oh, she's there. Yeah. So we're all sad. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, we're going to uh, resume with today's activities. Uh, the next panel is the health panel, health tech and health AI panel. I also uh, want to recognize a few additional uh, representatives who are here who I, I did not see before. Representative Tracy Mara is here. Representative Oxa is here. And Representative Keith Denning. So, and I thank you before. Uh, Representative Baumgartner is uh, here as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott Lowry. Just last week, Scott ran a fantastic meeting on CT Health AI uh, and how we can, well, I'll let Scott take it over from here. Thank you, Scott. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, first, a little bit of background about me. I am a banker by training. And I uh, worked for numerous years for Chase Manhattan Bank International, living in London, Frankfurt, Athens, Beirut, and Bahrain. Uh, I left Chase to become CEO of a bank in Arizona, sold the bank to Citibank, and moved to London, where I was part of what was the largest real estate project in the world at the time. Uh, sold that project sometime ago, retired to the mountains of Utah and went skiing. And uh, after retiring for a while, uh, my wife finally said, Get out of the house, you're driving me crazy, you're driving the dog crazy, go do something. Uh, out of that, uh, I had a friend that was the CEO of a bank in Utah, Zions Bank, and Utah just passed a law around digital signatures. And uh, my friend concluded that that looked like a banking business, digital signatures, and we should get in. So we, we started a company called Digital Signature Trust, uh, which was about creating one of standard, a standard around digital signatures and then getting the banking industry uh, to adopt them. One of the things that came out of that, the uh, American Bankers Association mistakenly named it for the best in banking uh, for the work we did in getting the industry to adopt those standards. Uh, after that, uh, we, that uh, company sold to Citibank. Uh, we retired some more, and then uh, ended up uh, same problem over again. Get out of the house, and uh, someone came into Starbucks last November and said, "Scott, have you heard about ChatGPT?" And I said, "No, I haven't." And uh, but let me check it out. There was an article in the New York Times that day that went into someone that like, went to great lengths to explain it and predict what it may or may not become. Uh, after reading that article, I concluded that there's a pony in there somewhere and that there might be something to do and that's why I moved doing. So uh, after talking to a number of people, it, it appeared that the uh, notion of a collaborative seemed to be, uh, make the most sense. Then uh, Lateef and I went to, uh, to take the idea to the governor. And uh, after that meeting, Dan uh, came away all in on AI, and uh, Dan is absolutely convinced that Connecticut can be one, can become one of the leading states in the country uh, in implementing AI. And within that context, he also believes that healthcare is perhaps the uh, leading industry to start with in trying to get Connecticut to uh, become an, an AI great state. The uh, Look, looking at all this, I'm a competitor by definition, things I've done in my life. And uh, my thoughts are if we're going to do it, let, let's do it right and let's become one of the great states in health AI. Uh, the problem or the challenge is we're already pretty far behind. If uh, I would encourage you to go on the web and look at Duke, look at Carnegie Mellon, look at Stanford. Look at MD Anderson, look at Cedar Sinai. These organizations all have well designed, well implemented AI programs that they've been working on for some period of time. So uh, there will be some catching up to do. 
Additionally, uh, going back to our uh, previous panel and talking about the workshops, uh, one of the challenge Wall Street Journal ran an article recently on, and I mentioned this at last week's meeting, Wall Street Journal ran, uh, ran an article talking about 30 tech-savvy cities in the United States. And to cut that short, we're not one of them. Uh, neither uh, Hartford or New Haven are in the top 30 top uh, tech seven cities in the country. Uh, an interesting thing about how that is calculated is basically through one ads. And they look at the one ads for AI jobs. And what does that say to us? It says there's not a demand yet for AI skills in the state of Connecticut. Well, we can say we need to prepare our workforce. Maybe we need to prepare the companies in using AI that will then lead to a prepared workforce. But at this moment in time, we don't seem to be, uh, no one's hair is on fire, let's put it that way. So the question becomes, how do we change things and what, uh, what can we do? And I believe that that's through collaboration. Uh, I use the term, we're better together. And while any one of our individual healthcare organizations may or may not be able to go toe to toe with Mayo, uh, I would strongly suggest that collectively we could. And so, unless we sort of come together, uh, it will be difficult for us to become one of the great health AI states in, in the country. Um, as, as part of this process, uh, we simply want to. Uh, create a merger or collaboration, if you will, between the academic organizations and the health board organizations. If you look at MD Anderson, they recently announced the uh, Institute for Data Science in Oncology. They announced this two weeks ago. And basically what it does, it brings together skills not only from Anderson, but other organizations around the state of Texas to bring to bear multiple skills, multiple abilities to tackle cancer. And I think, again, the same thing needs to be done here. We need to bring the academic organizations, the healthcare organizations, and other uh, smaller companies in the venture field together to collaborate to create the solutions that be can begin to make a difference in our state. As part of that process, we hope to uh, have some initial working groups up within the next 90 days. When I say working groups, they would be a mirror image of what MD Anderson has done with cancer. We can pick and choose where we would like to go. If we would like to form a working group around diabetes, we can do diabetes. If we want to do it around cardiology, we can do it around cardiology. The, the benefit of the collaborative and multiple institutions is that we can chart the roadmap on our own. We don't, we're not limited by only what we as an, one institution can do. So I would hope to be able to announce, as I said, within the next 90 days, uh, the formation of a working group around one of these disciplines. Also, it's not just healthcare that we need to do one of our patient uh, services. We need to think about reorganizing the healthcare systems and how can help how uh, AI can help us in creating new efficiencies and new processes to make the healthcare industry a more efficient industry. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have some people in the revenue cycle world who want to uh, create something for us there. We will bring in hopefully some of the large payers as part of that process. So together, an integrated project with uh, providers, payers, and outside specialists. So with that, uh, we'll see what some people who are practitioners in this space already are doing and see how we can bend that into uh, things we're doing going forward. Please, Jody. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Jody Gillen. Seven months ago, I became the president and CEO of BioCT. We are the trade organization for the life science industry across the state of Connecticut. So I'm very honored to be here representing about 300 member companies uh, that span life sciences. It's everything from all academic centers to Yale through community colleges, to even architecture firms building out lab spaces up through drug developers and AI and digital real world evidence companies. 
So a bit about BioCT. Um, when I came on seven months ago, I changed our mission. I wanted to make sure it was clear that one, we represent the entire state, and two, we represent all life sciences and really tie back in improving patient lives. If you're familiar with the bio organization in DC that covers the United States, there are 46 state bio organizations, each with a different spin and focus. Um, in terms of what members get from being a member, we have a purchasing program that really supports, especially a startup ecosystem. We have a government affairs subcommittee that's incredibly active. We have communication channels. I hope everyone signs up. They will be around up. You can sign up on biocct.org. We have a career portal. We do a lot in recruitment, retention, education. And then we have a number of events that added actually event a month by um, topic by region and by function. My personal priority is I call the three P's. So first and foremost is policy making sure that we're working with folks such as those in this room to ensure that we have an ecosystem that's supportive to companies in the state and individuals in the state. The second I call people, and this is everything from middle school mentoring, ensuring diversity in careers in STEM, um, from even the middle school level and education and ensuring STEM education, up to C-suite recruitment, development, training, and workforce. And the last uh, to have a key was around perception. So not just being nationally recognized, but even internationally recognized. How do we get companies even from uh, across the Atlantic to set up their US headquarters here in Connecticut? And we do this in partnership with other great organizations across the state. Just a highlight of some key events, and you can find more on our website. Um, but this AI webinar that's planned for May, it's looking like it's actually going to turn into a live event at Boeing or in Mohine. We have an incredible collaboration, actually, with IBM, which wasn't mentioned this morning. Um, but now I understand um, that it came out of this partnership in, in Ridgefield. So I'm really looking forward to putting together a live event uh, on AI with them probably in the fall. Um, I wanted to highlight one, my experience, I, I have about 27 years in industry before my seven months in BioCT. So I worked for three large pharmaceutical companies, Novartis, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and then four startup companies, one being at Killian Pharmaceuticals that actually brought me to New Haven at 300 George Street. Um, so I personally leverage AI, especially in recent years. And what I want to do is also I collected a few examples from our member companies to just highlight the tremendous advancements um, in the state and how companies are leveraging AI. So for me, I think if we look at industry, we have a real challenge um, across the board. It used to be that it, we said it took a billion dollars in 10 years to get a drug approved, and that's changing now. So now it, it's anywhere between one to two billion dollars, and we're inching more towards 12 years to get a drug approved. And then if we look at FDA statistics, it used to be they averaged over 50 approvals a year. Now last year it was 37 approvals. So if you have those forces, and then you have cost containment for drugs, there are these competing forces that are putting a lot of pressure on our industry. So for all my last companies, there was one primary conversation at the board level and one focus to the company, and that's how to do things better, cheaper, faster. And we used to negotiate with boards because we used to say, you know, you typically can get two out of the three and you need to prioritize. But there's tremendous pressure now to have all three. And the best way to do that is really by leveraging artificial intelligence. And I think we're reaching an era that if a drug developer isn't leveraging artificial intelligence in some capacity, they're losing out. They'll be less likely to get investors, and they won't be able to do things as efficiently. So then the question really becomes, how do they do this? For me personally, it was uh, at Pfizer when I started leveraging AI, and it was in 2018. The challenge being there's so many ways you can do it in an inexpensive fashion, there's so many ways you can do it, and it's much more expensive. 
So if we look at negotiating you know, budget and tool, typically we have tiers, and especially if this is around clinical trial recruitment, there are some diseases that one are harder to diagnose, two is harder to find patients, making things take longer and more expensive. So there are tools. I remember at Pfizer, we built a red flag tracker for doctors, for cardiologists. This is the first um, ever red flag tracker in the EMR systems. We were able to alert them. If patients had these symptoms, these symptoms, they may have amyloidosis, and here is the trial. And we start funneling and making sure patients are get diagnosed correctly. We also did this for finding patients for clinical trials. It was just a more expensive way to do it, but actually it would happen so much faster that you'd be able to recruit that it paid its way forward that most companies are leveraging AI for patient finding. I want to highlight a few of our member companies and I'll highlight just three examples. Um, AI Therapeutics, they actually changed their name to Orf AI recently. They're a Guilford-based startup in a rare disease space. And they're using AI, um, they built their own platform. We see this a lot with drug developers that they there's two different models. We have the Rally Bio model where they partner with Accentia, which is an AI company, so that they can leverage AI. But then there are other companies that are developing their own tools, and then they can outlicense this tool, and it's another source of partnering and income. So a big term in the healthcare space is around kids. How do you find the right molecule and how do you find it for the right target and doing that efficiently? And that's where most drugs tend to fail. You can have a safe and tolerable molecule. If you don't pick the right disease and the right target, you have failed. So that's what we call HIC and we need to do that efficiently. Finding the right molecule for the right disease, the right patient population, the right subpopulation, the right cell. Another great example, um, this is such an interesting company for me, Enco. Uh, they're in the crop space, and they have a facility up in Stonington, incredible multi-acre facility, and they have their own AI platform in the crop call space that they're leveraging and partnering with other companies, and they found their own kits to develop products in crop health which is a huge untapped industry that needs a lot of attention. They're really renovating and, and revolutionizing this field. And then this is one of my favorite examples from BioXL, actually, because BioXL is a new database company. They're right here on Church Street. And they're leveraging artificial intelligence across the entire spectrum of drug development, up through commercial launch and post-approval. And they're actually repurposing drugs. And this is incredibly efficient, leveraging AI to repurpose drugs because sometimes drugs can be tested safe, tolerable, but companies have chosen the wrong target. So having all that compendium of data but finding the right target for them could cut that timeline and cost in half. Um, and what they're also doing, they claim to be the first company to ever get an approval um, from the FDA by leveraging uh, a repurposed drug, leveraging artificial intelligence. So just one last comment on the FDA because we're seeing a lot of change. They have preliminary guidance that came out in May. Now, this is also new to them, but they shared this to that in 2021, 100 submissions leveraged AI for drug development. And that was 2021. I'm sure that number is, is exponentially <laughs> grown at this stage. And they plan to have their final guidance out in 2024. Going or in Ohio is actually you know, right here in Richfield, supporting the FDA on developing that guidance. So it's really a hot space. And I think they're just trying to wrap their heads around how to approve drugs and how to have these conversations about appropriate use of AI, you know, instead of being reactive and seeing what companies are doing, provide guidance so we all do it in accordance with you know, the proper principle. Okay, thank you, Jody. I, I call your attention to the FDA. Not only do they have challenges uh, approving drugs, they have challenges approving AI algorithms. And there's a specific program software as a medical device you can find on their website. They have uh, come out uh, a new management framework or risk management framework that they have out for comment now. 
I think it would be useful one to take a look at that and to the extent that you think you could drive it or influence in a specific direct direction, they're looking for help. So uh, they also have a very comprehensive program on collaboratives. They have uh, 12 collaboratives up and running today in various areas, cardiology, pharmacology, etc. And uh, they will be an observer in our efforts here. So the FDA is is a good friend and we should nurture that friendship as much as possible. Paul? Thank you. Uh, so I'm Paul Plichak. I'm the Chief Data Science Officer at the Jackson Laboratory, uh, which I joined in the summer this year as their inaugural data, Chief Data Science Officer. Before coming here to Connecticut, I spent almost 20 years at the European Bioinformatics Institute, uh, which is near Cambridge in England. Um, and in that role, I was the Associate Director for uh, EBI's Data Services. So the EBI presents uh, a collection of around 50 uh, large-scale databases that collect scientific knowledge and make it reusable for other members of the scientific community. I was specifically responsible for our genomic databases and, uh, and, and some of the data management for uh, what at the time were some of the largest data collection projects that uh, biology had undertaken. The Jackson Lab uh, is an independent nonprofit biomedical research organization. Um, so they are a, uh, and we are a, a unique combination of research, education, and resources. And the goal of the organization is to facilitate the discovery of precise uh, genomic solutions to disease, uh, to understand how we can find what causes disease and to empower the biomedical community to do this research themselves. The Jackson Lab was founded in 1929 in Bar Harbor, Maine. Uh, the, we are the largest provider of mice for biomedical research uh, in the world. And we provide most of the mice that get, uh, get used in the United States and uh, a, a large fraction of those that are used outside the United States. Currently, we have 11 global locations, uh, including Farmington, uh, where the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine shares the campus of the UConn, uh, UConn Health Campus. Uh, and JAX, uh, as we kind of commonly call ourselves, uh, we're world experts in using mice as a model for human disease. And this is a challenge in a number of ways. Uh, the mouse has been critically important for understanding human disease, critically important for drug development. Nearly every drug that uh, has been approved has spent some period of time uh, in a preclinical mouse model as part of its testing. And those mice almost universally had their origin at the Jackson lab. And so because of this, we have an interest in optimizing how the mice get used uh, and how we can use these human, these math models of disease to, or these math models of disease to improve human health. So when you try to understand how to best uh, map a human and a mouse, obviously a mouse is not a human. Uh, and there are many situations um, where it is, there are, however, there are many situations where the mouse is an ideal model for what we're trying to, trying to understand in our human. There are other situations where it is not. Uh, and so we are trying to tease apart these two things and provide resources to the community such that other people can use our models to discover things as effectively as possible. The way to think about uh, trying to make this connection between human and mice is that both of them are seeking a uh, two different languages of how mammalian life works. Uh, and we're trying to translate between these two languages. Unfortunately, we don't understand either one of the languages. Uh, and so we're a little bit like trying to work on the Rosetta Stone without the third language that we understood, um, and trying to piece together the meaning and the, the meaning of both at the same time and how they translate together. Now, it's sort of amazing that we actually make quite a bit of progress on this uh, because it's, it's a, at some level, apparently a nearly unsolvable problem. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is our goal as we bring in data. Over the past roughly nine years at, at the Jackson Lab, we've generated an enormous amount of data uh, on the laboratory mouse. Other people have generated this as well. And we want to make it available 
uh, in ways that allow people to make discoveries on it and to um, pick the best maps for their um, for their research. Unfortunately, um, for doing this data analysis, the data itself has changed dramatically. So even DNA sequencing data from 15 years ago compared to DNA sequencing data today um, has a host of different biases associated with it. It's not directly comparable. This turned out to be one of the areas where it may be possible for AI to help us to harmonize data in certain ways so that we can analyze it in uh, using some of the techniques that we already have. And this is an important, uh, this data harmonization and data curation, which is one of the key aspects of producing and using data in biomedical research, is one of the key ways that AI can simplify what is now uh, and has been for most of the last 25 years, a largely manual and human task. Another opportunity we have um, is to use AI in ways that discover connections between humans and models in disease in ways that aren't immediately obvious. There is the information that's there. As I mentioned, it's a they're translating between two aspects of how life is done, but without knowing the two languages. There is a as we go forward, there are connections that we can't see that should be able to be made. In doing so, we believe we have the opportunity at JAX to dramatically improve um, the entire process, the entire long process of drug discovery by improving the preclinical model stage. Um, that is where we are experts. When we can make this more efficient, either by choosing a better model to do the experiments, um, or by determining that the model is not appropriate, or the gut model in our case is not appropriate, and a different model should be used, we believe we can significantly accelerate this entire drug discovery process. There are different parts of the process that uh, are outside of, of our purview at JAX, for example, the clinical trials, which we don't do, but we believe we can have a significant impact on the part that we have, uh, uh, we have historically contributed to. And so that's just a couple of the opportunities that we see that we have in this area. Um, and we look forward to what comes from all of them. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, quick question. Is anybody from Indeed still in the room? Indeed was only on there. Only on there. Or workforce? Work. You know, just as an aside, one of the things you might do is create a AI job index. How many are being advertised on a monthly basis? And we can track that over time, would give us a sense that the industry is growing, shrinking, or moving laterally. Okay. Uh, next up will be uh, Sandra Saldana. Sandra, please. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. Great. Um, is it okay if I share my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Let me just pull up some slides um, to give you a little bit of context about Alva Health and what we do. Um, so Alva Health is a, um, a Yale University spin-out. Um, we started our company back in 2017 um, out of uh, a group in the neurology department at the Yale School of Medicine, um, along with, with Dr. Sheth, Dr. Kevin Sheth, who's director of neurocritical care and emergency neurology there, as well as Dr. Hitan Saveri, who's a faculty in the neurology department, uh, electrical and computer engineer as well. Um, and then the the technology that we're using was uh, developed in collaboration with Dr. Ronald Koifman in the mathematics department at Yale. Um, so what we're doing is we're developing a non-invasive wearable device for real-time stroke detection. Um, and I'll move uh, quickly through the slides, but just to give you some context about the problem we're working on, um, one in people in the U.S. are uh, over the age of 25 are living with a high risk of stroke. Um, and stroke, ischemic stroke happens when a clot blocks an artery in the brain, preventing the flow of blood and oxygen, um, which um, unlike a heart attack, which is sudden and, and comes with pain, um, a stroke is very subtle and it might feel like a headache, but in reality, there's brain tissue that's rapidly deteriorating under the surface. Um, and 20% of people will die from their stroke. And of those who survive, uh, the 80% who survive um, will have to relearn basic functions like how to walk, talk, and, and tie their shoes. 
Um, in addition to that, there's a $67 billion in, in healthcare costs to the U.S. healthcare system um, that are really avoidable and unnecessary. Um, and this is because patients are left with chronic disability um, that requires specialized care. Um, the good news is that there are drugs out there and treatments that can be administered quickly um, and, and in, in order to prevent these uh, terrible side effects. But 90% of patients do not get this help because the signs of stroke are so difficult to detect. And so um, that's the problem we're addressing. It affects 880,000 people in the U.S. each year. It's a over three and a half, $3 billion market annually. Um, and our initial indication for the product we're developing uh, will apply to stroke survivors and, and TIA or mini stroke patients. Um, but our vision is, is to eventually help everyone in the U.S. who is living with a risk factor for stroke who may not have had one yet. Um, and that, that includes uh, hypertensive patients, type 2 diabetics, people with high cholesterol, atrial fibrillation, and so on. So this is our solution. Um, and so it, it consists of two wristbands that contain wearable sensors. Uh, there's uh, These devices are paired with a smartphone app, which is connected to the cloud, um, where we have um, AI and, and machine learning algorithms that are automatically looking for the onset of asymmetries in the upper body movement, which is one of the hallmarks of, of stroke. Um, now, this sounds like a pretty simple concept, um, but in practice, it is um, it is a bit more challenging because each person's movement signature is different. Um, it really is kind of a personalized uh, phenomenon to each individual, um, and so you really do need um, higher level algorithms and and things like AI to to be able to create that personalized detection that allows you to to detect this uh, phenomenon reliably across a heterogeneous population. Um, so the, so these uh, the system essentially, um, we believe, will enable us to detect the onset of stroke um, within that critical four and a half hour window that um, that is uh, the window when patients would benefit the most from the available therapies. Um, so the way it'll work is when a patient goes to the hospital, they've um, they've had a stroke or a mini stroke, um, the neurologist will prescribe our product and then begin monitoring them for uh, the, the chance of a recurrent event, uh, which is uh, it's likely to occur in the first 90 days after they've had a stroke. Um, this uh, is about 10 to 15% of, of patients will have a recurrent event, which is uh, not only more devastating physically for them, but it's also more expensive for the US healthcare system. So that's that's kind of our, our target. Um, so, so once the system's activated, um, you know, we, we activate the, automated monitoring in the cloud, um, we will we'll then be able to notify patients immediately when they've had what looks like a stroke. We give them an opportunity to say, I'm okay, or I need help. Um, and if they don't respond within two minutes, we then connect them with a trained medical responder at a call center who will then call 911 and not notify the user's emergency contacts. Um, and the goal is to make sure that every stroke victim gets to the hospital within the critical treatment windows um, for, to, to prevent disability from stroke. Um, so, so with this system, I would say um, the way that we're utilizing AI to, to, um, to make this happen is, I would say in a couple of ways. So the, the first one is really in creating that personalized movement, movement signature um, to, to deliver that personalized detection um, that is you know, specific to that individual. Um, that can only be done with with um, machine learning and AI algorithms. Um, and then in the future, when we actually get to market um, and we're looking to to deploy this in a high risk population, um, our hope is to then also utilize um, AI algorithms to be able to identify those patients who are most likely to benefit from this from this treatment. Uh, or I'm sorry for, from this from this medical device, um, and and the reason um, is because you know not every patient um, who is you know part of a a particular health insurance plan might be benefit might benefit from this, but we want to be able to tailor the 
the delivery of the product to the right folks so that we achieve the maximum benefit to, to the U.S. healthcare system, to the patients, um, and make sure that we're, we're efficient in that way. So those are just a couple of examples um, in which, you know, AI allows us to um, deliver uh, a really cutting edge service, um, a service that's not uh, currently available to patients. Um, and so, so that's why I think that it's important to, to promote um, this type of work. Um, and, 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 um, and I'm, I'm happy to be here to talk more about what we're doing. Um, so, you know, we did uh, have a chance to, to validate this, this technology uh, at Yale New Haven Hospital. We um, were able to create algorithms that are highly sensitive in moderate to severe strokes. We've also collaborated with uh, an assisted living uh, facility in Connecticut, Maplewood Senior Living, um, on a healthy volunteer study. So with this, we were able to, to generate the evidence that uh, that we need to, to show the potential benefits of this technology. Um, we also um, did file uh, and receive patents around this technology through um, through the, the Yale University, uh, Yale Ventures. Um, so we're really grateful for that collaboration. Um, and we have ongoing clinical studies to further validate this concept, um, to prove the concept that we, we can deliver continuous monitoring um, over a 90 day time period in high risk patients. Um, and we're kicking off a prospective clinical trial uh, early next year that will validate the algorithm um, for the first time outside of the hospital. So we're really excited about that. Um, so with that, um, you, you know, we, we are still in the early phases. Uh, we're going to, um, we're, we're targeting a FDA submission at the end of 2025 or early 26. Um, this is our team. Um, again, very heavily, we have leveraged the talent at Yale, Yale University, but over the years we have uh, grown um, outside of outside of the Connecticut environment um, through some of the you know the needs to 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 find that that uh, AI talent um, that uh, is necessary to to make these technologies happen. So I'm happy to chat more about that as well about our experience with uh, with finding the right folks. Um, we were we've been funded through. Um, NIH, NSF, and the Cedar sinai Healthcare Accelerator. Um, and then we also uh, did uh, win the grand prize at MedTech Innovator Competition in 2020-21. So through the support of these different awards and funding mechanisms, and of course, um, starting out with Yale University support back in, in 2017, um, we've been able to, you know, get as far as we as we have um, and really, we're really grateful for that support. So I'll stop there, um, and um, I'm happy to, you know, jump into the conversation. And if you have any specific questions, sure. Okay, Sandra, thank you very much. Uh, we have some questions that were sent in by uh, you all prior to the event, and we'd like to ask the panelists' the opinion on some of these. So the first one is: Are there any resources, or what resources does the state have? that it might be able to share with organizations and help them in their journey to producing AI solutions and getting them into the marketplace. Good. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of tremendous organizations, state-led organizations that provide support across the board. So advanced PT, PTNet, um, BioPT is a state organization, but we're an organization that covers the state I think also there are different chambers of commerce that the New Haven Chamber is incredibly strong. And you know, there, there are a large number of resources across the board. They're not always financial, sometimes it's knowledge transfer. I think also with um, different venture arms, if I look, you know, we're, we're a state with a lot of startups. So if I look at the startups coming out of Yale, out of UConn, support from Connecticut Innovations, there are a lot of tremendous organizations in the academic centers that provide a lot of support, including programs like entrepreneurs and residents that provide um, knowledge transfer. Paul, your thoughts? Uh, so I think some of the some of the ways this support can be provided include training programs, especially training programs that sit at the interface between um, 
biology and, and computer science, uh, which are um, most people are interested in those and, and they, they tend to be uh, they tend to be well described in those who did. Okay. Uh, Sandra? Yeah, so I, I think that there's a a great amount of talent. Um, you know, I can only speak to to the um, the environment at Yale, uh, specifically since that's where we spun out of. But, um, you know, with the collaboration with the mathematics department um, and then, um, you know, being able to work with some of the students in that department, I think we were able to make a lot of progress initially. So, I mean, I think that the computer science mathematics is fantastic um, in the area. Um, I think where uh, we we did run into some issues is in, you know the competition as a startup um, when especially a couple of years ago you know where um, there was a real shortage of talent in uh, tech talent particularly um, um, and and you know these large tech companies are really snapping up a lot of the talent and paying huge salaries um, I think that there was um, you know some some struggle there and in, in competing with those uh, large companies, but um, but I think the talent's there, and so I think that um, you know making making it um, you know if, if the state could do something to to kind of incentivize those uh, students who are coming out of universities to stay in in the state and to kind of work with the the local companies um, that are emerging, I think that would be really greatly beneficial. Um, we've also, um, when we spun out in 2017, um, you know, we worked with the Yale Entrepreneurial Institute Summer Fellowship, um, which is now part of, it's now Sci City. Um, so that was a really great resource for us to start our, our business as, as a kind of first timers. Um, and then over the years, we've had an ongoing, you know, collaboration with the OCR, which is now Yale Ventures, um, you know, on, on the technology licensing side. Um, so I think kind of, a you know, the confluence of multiple parts of the university um, uh, working together to promote well, these technologies yeah. um, uh, is I, really I, valuable. We're trying to, to get at the concept, does the state have anything tangible that it could say, here, we want you to have this, your business will be better. And I think one of the things I've heard in several of these meetings is computer capacity. That the state has the capacity. Many startups uh, and universities simply don't have the capacity to do the type of research they would like to. So, uh, is it possible, Senator and uh, friends <laughs> of the Senator, is it possible to create a mechanism whereby the state could make the computing capacity available to the startup, the AI startup industry? Jody, does that make sense? Is that a problem? Um, I mean, I think there are some resources where there's capacity maybe for their leveraging them. I just heard um, Sacred Heart, they have an incredible program in artificial intelligence. They definitely have the capacity. Um, so I think it, it's finding these pockets and, and expanding upon that. Okay, Paul, do you have a need for more computing capacity? Um, so I, I think there's computing capacity is always is always valuable, but to be quite honest, at, at the moment our capacity is quite well matched to um, to our needs. Okay, very good. Uh, next question: Are there any frictions that state regulation creates for these companies that makes it difficult for them to develop their full potential? Is the state doing something that just makes life harder than it needs to be? Sure. Um, I don't think there's anything in particular in progress in artificial intelligence. I think there could potentially benefit to be additional incentives. So if we look at other states, there are maybe clusters being formed in Rhode Island and Massachusetts and New York that could foster and further catalyze the state. So I don't think there's anything um, preventing progress, I just think we can always continue to develop and expand upon what exists. Paul? Um, yeah, I guess I, I'd agree with Jerry. I don't, I don't think there's any um, obvious hindrances. There are some things that uh, uh, 
I, I'm not necessarily on this state level, but there may be an opportunity to assist for um, helping facilitate uh, data being shared across organizations in certain situations. Um, and especially for, for the cases when having more data or um, kind of matchmaking of certain situations of, of people with certain types of disease or so on, I, I can imagine that there, there could be uh, state level or regional level programs that try to connect these individuals such that they could be uh, more quickly uh, accessed uh, sure. various types of research. Sure. Sandra? Um, so, so we haven't really experienced um, frictions uh, per se, um, but um, I guess going back to your other question around computing capacity, um, that is actually a super valuable resource for companies that are working in this AI machine learning space um, where, you know, resources, uh, access to, to um, you know, cloud uh credits, uh, collaborations with, you know, with the providers of, of, um, of cloud services, um, at the early stages when companies are, are still kind of fundraising and, and still trying to find their, uh, you know, um, their funding and they're trying to get on their feet. Um, I think that's, that's a really key resource that, um, would really help, um, early stage companies to, to bloom, um, in this space. So for example, Amazon Web Services, I know that they do a lot of um, programs with accelerators um, where they provide um, free credits to test out ideas and, and kind of grow. And that's something that's, um, it's been increasing in costs lately. Um, and I think, uh, you know, in the future, that's that's an area where I think folks could really benefit. Okay. Uh, are there any competitive, you know, I said early on, uh, I'm a competitive person, and I think we as a state should want to be one of the best states out there. What, what will stop us? What will get in the way? Why can't we be great? Or can we be great? Jody? I, I definitely think we could be the greatest state in the United States. Um, I think we have all the raw ingredients. Um, I think one challenge in the space is around training talent, and we had a whole panel on that, so I can just um, add what I've seen. I think um, you know, there's so much job security in the space, but there's a lot of open positions, and we need to be able to attract the right individuals to the state, keep them here. And I always like to do a root cause analysis. To my knowledge, there's only one PhD program um, in AI, and that's at Yale. So when I meet with our other academic institutions, and I see these incredible programs, you know, either in the bachelor's level, master's level, and I say, you know, what do you do about PhDs? And they probably share, well, they send them to Pennsylvania, these other states. You tend to find um, a career and then a job where you finish your academic training. So we're training top talent at your master's and then shipping them off. So to me, you know, that's a low hanging fruit on something that keeps um, training workforce here and then match them with jobs. Yeah, uh, I would agree. As I mentioned earlier, take a look at Duke, uh, Stanford, uh, MIT, Harvard, and so forth, that they're AI efforts and they all have the capability for getting bachelor's, master's, and PhDs in AI in healthcare. So uh, they're quite well developed in that. Also, from a training perspective, uh, Stanford has a great five module course for $79 a month. Yeah, you know, work at your own pace is terrific from fiction from ground zero to uh, the issues in AI for healthcare. So. Yeah, I'll just go back to my point because Kelly's nodding her. <laughs> but these centers, these academic institutions, they want these programs. So again, we have all the ingredients here. We just gotta get together and make it happen. Okay. Oh, uh, another question. We have Dan in the room. Uh, so this is our chance to tell him what we need. How can we help government and organizations coordinate their efforts to build the AI? programs in the state. Paul? Um, it, so, I, I mean, I think one of the things that we can do is events like this, where we get people together uh, and we identify uh, what the opportunities are, what the challenges are, um, how we can move things forward, and 
and, and make these into connections. Uh, Connecticut is a small state, and, and so there's the ability to get people into rooms that are about this size to get nearly all the decision makers um, in in the same place uh, at the same time. Uh, it's, I think it's it's difficult to underestimate the importance of, of having people together to to make decisions and, and push you forward. Mm -hmm. Sandra. I think that there's an opportunity going back to, to what was said before about the talent um, pipeline. So I think that there's a great opportunity for the state to um, be be involved in creating a, a formal pipeline of um, so some of these graduating students, uh, undergrads, as well as PhDs and masters um, and, and, you know, making those connections directly with with the companies that are hiring, that are looking for those people. Um, when you formalize it, I think um, there's sort of like a, a vetting process, right? Where, you know, the state's involved um, or, you know, you've got mentors, you've got people with who know about the space that are kind of vetting the the talent. And so that kind of increases the trust level um, for companies, particularly small companies that are, you know, just hiring potentially some of their first staff um, so I think that that could really strengthen um, the the pipeline and 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 even attract people from outside of the of the state. Um, we actually recently were part of um, a program uh, that was sponsored by the National Science Foundation for Phase Two SBIR awardees, um, where the NSF um, paid for um, about half of the summer internship. Uh, for PhD students, um, so actually they were they connected us to a student um, in at the University of Iowa Mathematics Department um, to to expose that student to our company, um, and it's something that wouldn't have happened without that formal program organized okay. by NSF. Yeah, thank you for that. I promised Joe the last word. Okay. <laughs> so I think this is an incredible start. Uh, look at who's in this room and presenting here today. Um, I like to always come away though with an action plan so that might be part of the breakouts and, and working groups. And you know, I'm just so happy to see so many policymakers in this room. I think that um, you know, to make the magic happen, we need to invest resources and it's challenging when budgets are tight. But I think the ROI on the investment will come back exponentially. So I think we're, we're all starting today. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Scott, thank you very much. And we have a round of applause for all of you. Thank you. And they all left us with things that I hope you put a pin in that we can follow up on because the next item is we're going to break into a separate workforce rounds table and a health tech rounds table. Um, you're going to have to exit the room and then there'll be someone to guide you to where the round tables are. I want to welcome Comptroller Sean Scanlon, who is here, and he will be co-moderating uh, the health tech round table with Nick D'Onofrio. And then Kelly uh, Valieres and I will be uh, co-moderating the workforce round table, uh, which is you know, some of the great things to follow up on uh, Paul. Uh, facilitating data sharing. I hope that's something that we can discuss within the health tech round table. Jody, I think that's a great idea for clusters and incentives to look at what Rhode Island and Massachusetts are doing. And Sandra, I think that's a point well taken on the tech workforce. That's actually something I heard from Yale you know, 10 years ago when companies were started out of the Yale Entrepreneurial Institute. Oftentimes they were told they had to be connected when they got venture funding. You know, the only reason was there wasn't enough entry level tech talent here. And so that's something that uh, hopefully we, we still need to work on, it sounds like. So, uh, but that you've given us all actionable items. And then we look forward to continuing the discussion. If you are online, um, there will be a breakout. Uh, MJ just put in a link there for the health tech round. They will be in a separate Zoom. We cannot record, I guess, two separate rooms for one Zoom. So you'll have to go into that separate Zoom for the health tech so that that can be uh, broadcast and recorded and then come back to this Zoom and we'll record out. So uh, thank you again, everyone, if you can go back there and then you'll get guide, guided to the breakout rooms. Oh, thank you.
I'd like to order a dog in my Yeah. I don't want to
still in new writing so that I mean, this goes pretty far. We could actually. All right. Oh, we are so ready. Oh, I'm going to go. Well, actually, no, this is the this is worst part. We can only go into how bad we're going to go. Yeah. Uh, if you don't want to do what I say here, I'll put it on the edge. Okay. Let me, I just need to take this. Not that one. You can go this time on me. No, I'm going to go this time. I think it's working for my two students. Oh, yeah, there we go. You want to hear something? So I'm
My name is Michael Ward. I'm the Regional Policy Analyst at the Commission on Children and Senior Protective Services. I'm also a member of the United States Commission on Civil Rights, the Connecticut State Advisory Committee. And we uh, had a briefing of this back in September of 2023, which was the Bronze of the Bill of Rights and the automated decision making, ensuring that we don't have to apply to some people in our higher impacts. Uh, I'm Carly Pratt. I'm the master's candidate for the Civil Public Health. Uh, I work with Michael Warren Mercer. Um, a lot of interesting research. Hi, my name is Megan Baker. I am the lead Asian American and Pacific Islander policy analyst for the Connecticut State Commission on Women, Children, Peace, Equity, and Opportunity. As Michael mentioned, there was a legislation passed about the AI Bill of Rights as we navigate the trajectory of the state and how to integrate AI. Those who are coming just how to best utilize that for the health of Connecticut. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Kelly Valerie's Chief Workforce Officer. And as you heard earlier, we're, we're integrating AI or have into our portal. But um, the next stage of our work is developing a workforce development platform that would be widely utilized across state agencies and other partners. And so it'd be really interesting for us to understand and learn how we could incorporate AI into that platform to help us determine the best uh, return on our investments and best outcomes in the types of investments. Thank you. I'm uh, James Roy, state senator, and I am working on uh, legislation with the state senate that's going to talk as part of it looking at uh, AI. Hi, I'm Alan Tan. I'm the co-chair of the Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, Equity, and Opportunity, and also a senator on work, my day job. Um, and I'm here today because I'm interested in policy with my colleagues over there, and also because I have three U.S. patents on technology that um, actually enables mass data collection and processing. Okay. I'm Melissa Lobster. I am from Worcester, Connecticut, and I'm the Commission on Lots of different uses of AI, um, but primarily in HR science and always. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Ambrosio. I'm the public policy and communication specialist for the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. Um, we've been really involved in uh, just trying to put together relational webinars and meetings, which Senator Roney was a part of at our Big Connect, uh, just to kind of better, um, you know, inform our business community on how to use AI, um, kind of what the risks are, and um, how to move forward with this, this era. So, thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Anthony Baird, um, members of the conference, and also um, I focused on looking at the aspects of AI and how to work with large amount of population to make sure that they're able to I'm acting for public affairs with Ready CT, which is our nonprofit organization that focuses on bringing education and workforce and business together. We are a recipient of career connect funding, which Kelly mentioned in her remarks earlier today. And here uh, through the capacity of the community about how all this intersects with K 12, uh, starting at the 12th third grade and moving forward. Hi, everyone. I'm David DeRoche. I'm from um, Quinnipiac University. I'm also a member of the Connecticut. Foundation for Open Government and the Connecticut Coalition for Freedom of Information, which worked with Senator Learning on last year's legislation. So I'm here really to, to advocate for transparency of processes, open access to information, and uh, ensure that uh, AI deployment doesn't exacerbate bias. Jeff Walker, um, with one hat on the chair of um, ACT, uh, she mentioned, uh, also sit on the board of the Workforce Council. Kelly, the um, Technical high school program here in the state, and during the day, I run a discuss business for this um, big IT service company, from, and we committed to a thousand jobs here in Connecticut. So, workforce incredibly important to us. Um, emerging tech incredibly important to differentiate We use AI all the time, and um, we're really looking at that that intersection of you know, what we're talking about today with healthcare, but with um, Healthcare and business, we're going to look at AI to scale, drive organizations, the big organizations. Hi, everyone. I'm Vahid Behsalam. I'm an assistant professor of computer science and data science. 
Dean of Anthony and Haven, I'm also the director of the security team. And where my team is working, waiting for the finance term date that we're going to say. Same thing as the security team. Um, I'm hopeful that we can explore this institution for facilitating basic AI literacy across the state, as well as accessible, enabling accessible skill based training for those that aren't tech workforce and emerging. Good. Uh, this AI working group. Yeah. Uh, the new time and then you can graduate from work. Involved in all kinds of topics and social including that's what it was. I'm Tom Duffy, Mr. Gregory Golda from Sacred Heart University. I'm mostly concerned with Creative uses of AI in academia. MJ. Hi, I am MJ. I am the clerk of the general law committee, um, and I'm really interested in running on all this AI. <laughs> I uh, James Azura, this is this foundation you would say. Uh, we're a nonprofit CSR branch of emphasis with uh, Jeff Walker, and we are uh, promoting a springboard data learning platform, which I believe has AI involved in the curriculum and more uh, <laughs> skills. Thank you, and Rock. Hey, everybody. My name is Rock Vitale. I'm the CEO of Easy. Uh, we build technology systems in the AI space for the uh, public and private sector. So things like analyzing video streams, photo streams, uh, as well as natural language processing. Uh, we built a ton of different applications at this point that do sort of multimodal processing. We've also done a lot of work in the workforce technology space, building Uber-like systems for things like healthcare as well. Uh, so, um, one of the first things that we have a cross section, like we have some industry here, academia, and uh, government. But I think one of the goals of, of the legislation is in the workforce development, especially looking at creating a citizen's uh, AI. Uh, but again, we wouldn't be creating content, but curating content from places like academia. Amazon have already put out these free courses. Uh, from the employers, I guess, to start, what are the skills that we should in, in talk about digital literacy? What are the skills that we first need to uh, even promote uh, with our citizens that people need to be learning to achieve these or that you're seeing lacking? Uh, from our perspective, from we see really at all levels, so the whole life cycle has been. Uh, they're looking at data science from the level of senior data science, and I think folks are very hard to get. And uh, and we're going to be monitoring. And so we're prepared as a, a large employer uh, through our university partnership, partner with the university because they're paying for for these students for the for the Also, we can have he is here as well, uh, because I think that's something that really going to be looking at the terms of where we're going to be looking at the higher end. Uh, all the is not going to get it. We're committed to uh, the budget. Other trees, uh, maybe even elementary school strategy for we're looking at it, the short term, medium term, long term, right? So the long term will be middle school and high school, and, and then looking at the other. Uh, does anyone else have? I'm talking about small companies, so we start at what we need to perform. 
we are primarily there like some food, so a lot of things we do. We are now a group the skill set we needed to four categories. Each one of them is difficult to get. So I start with uh, a big part of AI is uh, sort of getting that data scientists that we do R and D work and come up with algorithms that actually work and they are effective. Um, they are newer, biggest uh, biggest uh, paper two application, sort of like that kind of thing. Very limited. Uh, typically today. Uh, second big thing is um, we have already worked on sort of that infrastructure and development of that infrastructure, whether it's some clouds, capability of people to know how to navigate it, you know, Amazon their services, what services are like, what services. So that capability is somewhat new and all these cloud platforms are coming over to services that are every day are changing. So it's very hard for me to something that it knows that those those services are very, very limited. Uh, third, I would just say managing large data, so managing moving uh, and uh, you know switching around large data. And the fourth is to complete application development from uh full stack from they have the data selected and then you can present it in an application. So, so I mean, all four categories, I would say, it's very hard. Um, what we deal with is, is the cost and availability. I would rather have people working with me and connect uh, to to them, work with them, than I'm aware of it. But then it's also easy to go out and just somebody else to do it from the department there or the future potentially. So when you think about what put it, about how what is the competition, so how we can manage all of that. Jeff, I may, can you say a little more about it? So, so totally understand that stack of those four points describing the image that we have to get, you know, that 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 entry side of the workforce growing. That said, what role would you see entry level people playing in those four steps? Like day to day, congratulations, you got a job. Or you got a job. Here's your job today. I'm an entry level qualification. Um, yeah, really, I mean, let's start with a four year degree and then maybe where that might apply for people. Okay. Actually, degree doesn't matter so much okay. to us and in the sense that it's a person capable. Okay. Um, it's logical and it's the right goals. I must get think of how they go out to the box. They can study their study of material out there and you can do it into uh, you know an idea of a course or anything like that. I think the uh, issue for us is that you know that you, you get the entry level it's uh, for a startup like that and we don't have so much bandwidth so Six months or one year of training. So for us, somebody who's already worked on a project has done something like that, even one or two, it's a good thing for them to come in. But still, uh, I would just say, you know, entry level would be a little bit experience. You don't have to train every single star for them, uh, but they are capable of, of comfortable with coding. Strong infrastructure. Some cases we can get some of the industry prices and some compensation of the data, but so we can have some of that capability. Um, so, across the board. Oh, 
Oh, no, I'm good. That, 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 that. I'm listening to what you're saying, and it's interesting you started with here's the technology skill set that we need, but then you switch to here's the foundational cognitive aptitude skill set that we need, and that they don't necessarily have to have that for your theory grade. So, how can for people who have those cognitive and other skills? come to you from a skills they hire about earlier on the panel. How would you assess those skill sets if they don't come for you to create what doors to be open to those who don't have them? If you can for me it would be give them a project for one month, let them try it out and see what they do. But there are some basic skills. Like they, they cannot like type on code, they cannot do it. So they have to have that much. But beyond that, you know, they don't need to have a, a, a big space and take the time to start what we need. Of course, we need only one space from the other. Can they ask their follow up? So I suspect that for a vacant engineering position, a final engineering position, you get anywhere between 20 to 15,000 applications and probably at some point. Uh, they're turning out on that they seem not to really affirm it. If one of the promoters all the students chat when you come back. Well, if an apology we at least gives you a first that there is no subject. So that's the best thing, but it's but just the college degree doesn't matter. Uh, you know, I think if they've actually done something in the project or somewhere they work and and you talk to them, they do this uh, is something that I'm very fundamentally at work with. There is about industry is the AWS cloud engineering. They are off. That's a very good start. So, that's the industry thing. I would. I would. Alex and Rich. Yeah. I have a couple of things. Since I have employed people in the tax space before, you know, to emphasize the point, a college degree means something, but some of the best people that ever worked for me in tax have been people who don't have the degree, who came out of high school. But to your point about aptitude, is, you know, one way is, like you said, give them the test. Another way is that you could also uh, create a uh, a training program, internship program, some opportunities for people who are new to the space or interested in the space to kind of prove whether or not they cut it or uh, they move on. So those are opportunities to develop talent that necessarily doesn't necessarily depend on the academic institution. Although the academic institutions are still equally important, we want to stress that. But uh, these are all ways that we can involve people into that space. And then I wanted to emphasize another point that was made earlier about infrastructure. So AI comes out to trust. If your AI can get corrupted by cybersecurity issues or that kind of stuff, you could have a, a somebody made a point about monsters that come out with something, you know, that could be a legitimate problem. And that's for the policy arena, something that we have to be concerned about is how do we use policy to create opportunity? How do we use policy to uh, be able to um, Make sure that uh, AI is trustworthy and it in, has integrity. So those are the things that I think workforce is important for because without the right workforce or the wrong person in the wrong place, this entire thing is important for all of our faces. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. That as well. I mean, just to give you a great example of the trust, I think you were traditionally at um, during parents' initiatives when thinking about the credit card, the credit industry, and how it, it went from a very secretive industry. So once they started pulling transparency, the industry just grew exponentially because of that, that being honest about the process enabled people to trust the process. So I feel like a big part of that trust is transparency and how these things are developed. And also, the right explanation, I mean, we talked about that the other day, but having the people having the opportunity to say why the decision was made. And just speaking from, uh, you know, from your perspective as an academic institution, I think all of us are hearing, you know, you don't need to agree and be like, oh, God, what are we going to do? I think we're all trying to see that, though, right? See the writing on the wall. You need the skills, don't necessarily need the degree. But to what extent, to what extent can academic institutions 
you know, contribute to that in some sort of way, whether it is through offering the certificate programs or participating in, in some way. Maybe it's not what we do, but how can maybe we shift what we do still provide you know, skills? Certificate that attaches to another degree, 
or if a uh, community curriculum building new programs, whatever it is, based on those needs. Um, and then the businesses also staying in an advisory role. But really importantly, businesses need to get connected to academic support and robust working so that they get to work on critical pro projects during internships or learning other types of formats so that they have the experience piece along with the credential piece, whether it's certification or a degree, but we're finding that experience if they don't have it, everyone's passing them over. So we have like 30,000 students that graduate higher ed and stay in Connecticut every year. And how many young people graduate to know the day and can't find a job? Because they don't have the experience component to the requirement of the degree. So businesses need to partner with them to help build out the robust. You can't you can't overstate the importance of the job training something. <laughs> And the other thing that they put in the internship is that we're going to do a pilot of the internship which um, I you know Richard shared with me a while ago that when Neil surveyed the companies from uh, the Entrepreneurs Institute, which half left, half stayed, the ones that stayed, the reason was they formed a connection beyond the campus. So getting students into internships is critical to being able to keep this top talent here, I think, as well as. I, I have a pin and a few other things I'm going to have. I know it was Tom and then Monica, and I'll say something more fun in the next question. Marketing is normal. Model, I think, and they look around and they saw all these jobs, all the skills that have long and corporate partnership, higher rates. Um, in our public schools, and we've been offering degree programs every year, past five years or so, we've been graduating at that great high school. So, in fields like software engineering and web development, um, before they graduate high school, probably means that the whole high school thing is probably more short term than thing than the medium term. One of the components, though, of the IBM thing is there's a go on the path um, in developing an internship partnership with FACSEL, European Services. Uh, five years ago, I went to a kind of a job fair thing with FACSEL, great money came to pass me a day, we're hired, just to keep the free graduate. Now we're at the point where we send them three or four interns here, and all of them get jobs. So um, the whole the degree doesn't matter. It resonates with me in terms of being more competency based than paper based. So um, I think the clear benefit for all of that stuff is that industry is driving growth, right? And I think that's absolutely how it happens. You have to stop guessing what you tell us. We're actually good at teaching stuff. Get you graduate with. Yeah, I, I think one thing that's kind of going unsaid in all of this is that, like you have a talented workforce and you have job openings and you need some on ramp to connect with people. And so we have a program at Workday that focuses on internships for people early in their career, people returning in their career, and for those considering this transition. And I think there's I can't overstate how important it is that industry also takes a part in this and that they see themselves as, as having a little in this and, 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 and making those opportunities as well. And they stay the benefit because they'll get really fantastic workers. Um, so there is, there is a benefit on both sides. And I think that there's a lot of different people who have faith in this who might not realize it. Um, and finding some of the first of home. And, and, and get more and more people. And I think it brings up some other questions. One of them, you mentioned the industry certificates are, are valuable. Um, what are other ways that we can skill, right? If we're transitioning to skill based hiring, should we be creating certificates which are local people to take assessment to show that they've learned skills? 
mentioned the projects, I know we're working doing projects. One of the components of the executive order on AI was the text button. Should we as a state be running some form of tech contest and allowing students, you know, with incentives, but then having them create digital portfolios to help them get jobs? Is that something that would be helpful for uh, the industry if you would see, you know, they built this portfolio of projects the contest and then kind of evaluate that that's something I'm uh, thinking about. George, and then I think okay. Thank you. That all that said as well as the other approach. But this the uh, all that you've spoken reminds me of my little parents that you will put in the title the purpose for cybersecurity. This is in 2000, I think. And we couldn't get um, information security professionals either because the information security world depends on them in the higher level mechanism structure. It's very mostly freedom scheme, information security. That era has evolved, but now we are in a certain flow where everybody understands AI, but you can't find the talent. So, putting on one of my hats, I'd like to take away from this conversation with your sharing. That CTMS, the uh, DOD, we've been trying to fund uh, programs in 2017, which is called Tech Talent Bridge, TTB. And um, that was a collaboration between our education initiatives, the uh, academia with the industry, where there's a 50 50 payment, they could get the on the job training. The same dilemma we had with information security professionals. We created CISP certification with CMA with Cisco and all the others. We couldn't get these graduates a job. And so I see this as a manufacturer, so maybe a workshop for me to take back and perhaps collaborate and try to push the new network of CTV and tertiary system. <laughs> we really need to help get our manufacturers part time job to get that six month skill set package, as you say. Otherwise, they are not going to get it uh, off the cuff. They have to sit and work and observe and listen. Thank you. Thank you. The Tech Talent Bridge uh, is on the CTV. Right. <laughs> so, are they employees of that program or of the company where they're working for? So, we get from Jewish American, and then they have vocational pay. Uh, and what for them was it to do? Did they get college credit? So I think that's a great right. an existing program that maybe we need to lever up Correct. to help with uh, companies who are looking for. It's sort of dip because there was no take up for the last year or so, but it gives me a reason to push for it. Great, thank you. Thank you. So I just want to thank Little C that we're having this discussion and related to another kind of stratified title of the industry, which is the lawyers and the process of the whole thing. back and just to remind everyone that there's uh, definitely a need when it comes to language accessibility, cultural competency, in particular in legal space, interface with the courts, and um, just the importance of civic engagement in general. So I'm so delighted to build the Legal Successes Foundation, and I just want to really encourage you all as you do this work to uh, you know go forward and see if there's other ways to engage, engage in local governments, helping to build trust in those interactions, and um, helping the residents in the state. We have seven oldest states in the country, we're the most diverse state in all of New England, and we have uh, a lot of need in the care spaces older adults and uh, in particular the court system not only on the criminal side but particularly on the civil side when it comes to housing matters and family members and other matters like that and there's ways that you could intentionally engage with the community spaces to it to go forward uh, that would that would really help just kind of to jump off of that um talking about the courts and one of the things that's like We've heard about how AI 
right? It was going to cost $85 million to generate 37 million jobs. It's going to change the future of work. A lot of the jobs that were going to be made are jobs that are going to be off the women of color. Um, so when they did, did there, still the analysts not proof by jobs, the percentage that can be replaced by gender is not the two highest for administrative assistance. Service jobs. Then I also jump to corporate right? Other um, things. Are we going to need corporate quarters? We'll be on technology that can tra transcribe. Or we'll need someone to control the book. We're not going to need it. So, that is so I, I applaud you for your commitment to make sure that this equity, as we go forward, we want to look that we're able to train everyone, right, to benefit the economy. So I guess that's the one thing I want to put out is how can we be in intention? If you, if you're going to see the report that's going to come out and say that uh, I think it's 29% of residents in Connecticut lack not all going to be online courses for being trained people. What are the ways that we can make sure we're reaching out to population people that are not urban or rural or uh, not? Um, I know community colleges are, are one way. I don't know. I don't want to talk to the particular floor, but I want to promote a couple of people. So, like, one is that, you know, Connecticut is a very diverse state, not just in population, but also by the geography. So, you know, when we go to the Litchfield Hills, of the part of Connecticut, it is incredibly expensive and difficult to bring um, access to high speed technology. Um, so, you know, what do we do to look at that? And then the other is um, to the point that the Exists, you know, um, our communities of color, underrepresented communities. How many of them come from families where, uh, you know, you and I, we all have these laptops. How do we put these in the hands of the people who need them the most? And then it's like me going to Chinese school without spending uh, time, without being able to take my hands. doesn't go well. So, how do we put this in front of students who their parents are so poor? They don't really understand or able to use the technology. But these might be the people, the point that I made earlier, who have the skill set that we're looking for. How do we get that out of them so that they can come in and be a part of a workforce? So, as we want to do that. Thank you. <laughs> I, I would just like to offer a high school, and thank you for the shout out from high school from back there. Um, Harvard Healthcare has made an investment in work pathway work in the healthcare sector. It started at Harvard Public High School, and I think expanded to a, a second pathway in East Hartford, and it's now moving into Eastern Connecticut because it's not just a corporate social responsibility play, it's part talent acquisition strategy. And it's working with student populations that are underserved. These are almost uh, overwhelmingly low income students of color, often English language learners. So, overcoming the language barrier that was referenced uh, just moments ago. And uh, High school is is not a long term play. It is part of the acute strategy to address this, and there's there's tremendous opportunity there. I, I don't think it's solved certainly, but one thing that I haven't heard in the conversation thus far is awareness. I, I think there's an entire population out there that has no idea about the marvelous opportunities of your business, um, and there's a lot of talent that's just being left on the table. And I think any policy that's going to address this. Problem really needs to get into the high school, as I've described it with career pathways, but also in the teaching workforce. We have teachers who have zero idea what to do with what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> and presently, the Connecticut Education Certification Council, I think it is, is meeting. Uh, Kelly is part of that research together on Monday uh, to look at teacher certification regulations so that. There can be pathways into that profession that maintain quality, uh, that maintain the high quality uh, of public education in the state, but that is modernized. Uh, uh, how many people in this room alone might want to sunset out of the business world and then bring that skill set into the classroom? It's almost impossible to do that now. You would have to take something called the practice test, which is so antiquated and so ill um, for the people here who have the, the talent that they have. So I, I think high school and teachers and teaching uh, are, are integral to this conversation in both the short, medium, both, both short and mid and long. I would just add to that if I could from the public school, the public school. 
the education software engineering is one of the most uh, vulnerable to AI overtaking. And I'm sure a ton of us have seen chat GPT write some code or whatever. It's sometimes better than what a person would write. Most of the developers I work with use Copilot or chat GPT in some capacity to code. It's a situation where in the future, it's not hard to imagine, hey, you're going to have a system where, you know, maybe instead of a hundred person dev team, you have a 10 person dev team or something kind of similar to how uh, automobile manufacturing has occurred. It's a situation where a shortage that I've seen quite a lot is 
people that can do sort of product management in addition to just coding. I think that's an area where there's actually a huge um, deficit where there's a ton of developers, you know, they can write code and tell them, hey, this is what I want it to do. They write the code, it does it. But I think going back into like a further like layer it is a situation where, you know, having somebody that can speak the engineering language, talk about AWS, but then also say, hey, this is what the business people want. This is what the actual use case is. I think sometimes you have a problem where, you know, developers will create an overly complicated system for what the use case is, and then you get tech debt, and then you, you know, have maintain it and so forth. And so it's a situation where, you know, with AI, it's not always a situation where you have to develop a model from the ground up. You have to get some data set with a million data points and train it from scratch. You've got open source systems like Hugging Face, but then you also have pre-trained models of things like AWS. And, and a lot of the time that is good enough for the use case, especially considering how fast things are changing in terms of, you know, API for OpenAI, for example, that has the assistance kind of functionality, the ability to fine tune existing models, um, having sort of a product management focus to sort of generate more of what I like to call the technical creative will be hugely helpful for Connecticut businesses because you'll be making the right choices um, about what to build instead of just being able to build it. And I think that's the I also find it to be close to the democratizing technology, the ability to have more data, greatest market. Be great. Jeff, I think you had your your hand in 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 your hand I think what we need to understand is there is a real appetite by way of example, um, the script training, which is we can find with the tech talent side of the teaching optometrics, and they're very interested in it. Um, the, the things have to change a little bit so that teachers get the stipend. So I say that. To encourage investment in teachers and their time, which we think especially as they are. Um, and as well, Comsat High, which is a magnet school up in Enfield, as a teacher recommending to teach purposes of establishing an industry advisory board so the business voice that's in this room can be in that school and inform the instruction that you want to see happen. If you have the opportunity to take the industry, I encourage you to take that from my And that's an excellent point about well, if we're not training them to build new AI systems, we want them to be able to teach the students how to use them. Right? You know, they code.org, when they did a study about computer coding, they found the best teachers for computer coding were the ones who just made it. Right? They just said they wanted to do it because they trained them by professionals. The board, I guess, depth of knowledge, if they go on to college or advanced, they could get that there. They just be exposed to it. I have three relevant points of um, about K to twelve uh, teachers and terms of AI technology, National Science Foundation and a round called uh summer teacher training on R E T um we have leveraged Promoting awareness and finding technical information for high school teachers of cyber security. That was a federal funding program. Now, um, I believe that I uh, will really offer have the ability to explore the weekend life uh, teacher training program in the same format. That was funded by the state. The second point I wanted to make is a follow up to the suggestion, the thought that uh, Dr. Maroney uh, proposed in the petition. At both um, higher education and K 12, competition in the form of hackathons, 
the form of uh, logic based uh, demonstration are uh, basically tools for seeing a particular or interest to that particular if it's sponsored by the university, that would be uh, even better because the, that, that immediately would take what they use. And the last but not the least one seems like there is quite a bit of difference, quite a bit of work with the plot. What's missing is an entity that fills the brokerage gap, an entity that connects both uh, training for partners and the industry for the work. And I think that's where the state government is by the platform that applies. Regular meetings, regular communications, um, experience sharing, skill sharing, and of course, adapting, co adapting, and either for the state of the art. Thank you. So, I think like this easy to fall into the trap of thinking that they got it worse. Okay. Right? And I acknowledge the entire I acknowledge the entire Right? The vast majority of Connecticut workers are never going to be consistent. You have to do some kind of training for those folks to learn how to use AI better at their training. Senator Ron, you said this to me the very first time you met. You're not going to lose your job to AI. You're going to lose your job to someone who knows how to use it. True. Right? <laughs> and I mean, kind of, obviously, the tech part is, is big, right? You want to be a movie. The vast majority of people need to be served. Sorry, let me hit the wrap up. Tell you then I'll just say well, thank you everyone for, for this robust conversation. Um, I'm really excited to hear that a lot of the feedback and spreads that you have are, are things that OWS and I work on. Um, if there are any of you that are interested in seeing our Weaver Loan Sector Partnership, um, please do. We have a convening coming up on January 11th for anyone who's interested. It'll be hosted at Central State University. This is the table that we set for our businesses to come to a table with a large voice and a collective voice that we can engage in these conversations in a regular format and be able to help and respond with the support partners wrapped around it. I just want to make you all aware of that. And, you know, we are business led. So we come to you to understand what your needs are and respond to that. So as much as you are involved, you'll get more back than the time that you have um, opportunity part of this. But I want to thank all of you for Thank you, everyone, for the robust discussion. I encourage you to, you know, if you didn't sign in, please make sure we have your email addresses. We'll do a follow up to try to stay connected. I think one of the statistics I have seen recently was that 68% uh, of companies now are trying to train up their own workforce on AI and general AI skills. Uh, the bad news is if you're training people, 58% of the companies say they're going to poach train people from other companies. Uh, but how can, we, how can we best partner to facilitate that training? Uh, Tom, thank you again for just, it, it's not just for computer science, but the SUNY Albany has launched an initiative that's AI across the, the arts and the humanities, and it is the new. Right, that we're going to need everyone's going to know how to interact as that co pilot. A great analogy I heard in another conference was it's the electric button, right? It's going to help make things easier when they get hard, but it's not going to operate with that. So I, I like that analogy, especially that I'll have to be placed. <laughs> but uh, with that, thank you all. We have the next final session starts at five o'clock. I think we came up the stairs to get here. We did. Four elevators. Yeah, so you can go down the elevator. There are stairs behind the elevator. The one for one floor up. So just one floor down. So thank you very much.
And MJ will leave you. And yeah, thanks to MJ, I've been nervous to stop on that for an and all. But I wanted to prove with the parents of people like my.
benefit from those types of, of, uh, of uh, organizational concepts. We talked about the FDA, you know, like, is there a way to build a better relationship with them at the state level? Uh, that kind of enables a lot of the other things that are going on inside the state in the healthcare arena, which there are a lot, um, to kind of accelerate things, maybe move them forward quicker. Um, I, I, it would have been not my session if I didn't bring up my own stimulation, which I did. Uh, and we had an interesting simulated conversation about that as an asset. Where should we put that asset? How do we collect that asset? Do we collect it in the state? Do we collect it regionally? Um, I think there's a lot more to be done there. And then we had this very uh, impassioned plea to keep the talent that we educate in Connecticut in Connecticut. And what do we need to do to actually incent them to stay here and work in this whole, you know, vastly extensive field of, of, uh, of healthcare, um, which we're actually pretty good at. And, you know, we're going to continue to work with Deanna on this. Then we have this really great um, uh, burst of energy from, uh, from Yale uh, on why don't we declare that Connecticut is the, it, it's, it's the preferred state for the knowledge worker. Why don't we start with that aspirational view and work our way backwards? So why don't we enable the talent, enable the data, enable the computational capability, the environment, and the capital uh, to be able to do this. Um, and there's a lot of good thinking, by the way, that goes, in, goes into that. I mean, that's not a bad set of thoughts. Um, we also had a rich and robust discussion about risk assessment. So you're doing this for what reason? What problem are you trying to solve? And do you actually understand the problems that you're creating right along with the problems that you're trying to solve? And can you render explicit the risks that you're taking so that they can, in turn, be mitigated? At some point in time. And I think we need to do more of that, just to be honest with you. Um, you know, we talk about workflow analysis, we'll do a better job of workflow analysis. The controller took that with it, by the way, and I expect them to be good on that. Um, and then, uh, James, um, two ongoing thoughts. Is it possible to create an advisory uh, for the governor uh, or for the executive branch? You know, on this topic, since you know we're going to disappear at some point in time, um, but the, the problems won't, the issues won't, the concerns won't, the need for expertise won't. Maybe the governor already has that group. Maybe you in the legislature already have that group. But at any rate, I wrote it down, so I'm saying it. <laughs> um, and then punctuate that. Everyone asks. How do they stay up to speed? How do they stay involved as we're winding down our efforts, uh, whether they're on, on the commission or not? How do they keep abreast of what our progress is as we set down to eventually write uh, and then eventually submit to the legislature um, our recommendations? So that is hardly a nutshell, and I apologize for that, but that's kind of what I took out of the healthcare group. Anybody was there, and I explained you, please put your hand up and by all means chime in. If not, my report, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say it's my favorite thing out of this task force, but definitely one of the, the last things in this task force we're going to get into. So uh, thank, thank you uh, for, that, uh, for that report. Um, and I think that's a common theme. That government can't do it alone, public schools can't do it alone, that we're all better, uh, better together. And I think I think everyone just emphasized that this is the start of an ongoing uh, conversation. And we're actually joining in a conversation that's been going in other, uh, you know, through the regional sector partnerships, through other industries. Really, nothing is completely new, but we're just redoing things that have, that have been done with a, a new topic. So uh, I encourage you in terms of how to stay in touch. If you didn't leave your email out front, please make sure if you don't have your email, or even if you have your email but you didn't sign in today, make sure you leave your email. We'll send a follow-up email with links to the recordings and links to information on regional sector, sector partnerships um, and how you can, can stay involved. Because again, we need everyone to work together. I think we said, uh, you know, alone you go fast, together you go far. And we know from Arvin, we're in the first inning, so we have a long way to go. Um, with that, I want to call up uh, Dan O'Keefe, 
the DPCD commissioner designate, who's been uh, a great asset to us already, and I've enjoyed working with him and look forward to uh, continue working with him. So much. Yes. Preference, yes, I, my preference is to walk around the live talk, so if you want to indulge me, I'll use this instead. Um, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to, to talk to you all. I uh, was asking for five minutes, so this is going to be the fastest new slide we've seen in some time. Some of you have seen this deck before, so for those for whom it's repetitive, I apologize if that will go any faster for you. Um, first, of all, by way of introduction, I, I do serve humbly as the state first chief of age officer. I took that in July, um, week before Thanksgiving, the governor is asking to become the next commissioner of the ECD, which I accepted. Um, and so, commissioner designated as the title until I confirmed for those of you who are part of that process. Uh, looking forward to talking to you soon. Um, so, as I travel around the state, uh, I get an incredible amount of skepticism. And he even came up in our working session before. You know, we are home day status. And, and I get why. I mean, I've lived here since 2011. I, like all of you, lived through what they now call the lost decade. So, in the 10 years post 2008, our economy contracted on an inflation adjusted basis. By the way, there's only three states that hold that distinction us, Wyoming, and Louisiana, which is not actually going to be. With no offense to those states, it's not the economic company seeking to be. Since then, we ran into a pandemic. You know, an externality on us sold for. Uh, by the way, in that year, our economy was 49th in the country. The only state to fare worse than us during the pandemic. Any guesses? Close. It was Hawaii. Um, Florida. Uh, since then, 2021, we were the 33rd fastest growing economy in the country. Last year, we were the seventh fastest growing economy in the country. That's BDA data. That's not a reporter told me that was a political talking point. I'm like, how come we're 49 is a new cycle, but we're seven is a political talking point? That doesn't seem particularly fair to me. Um, what, what led to that? It was a couple of things. It was a recovery of our advanced manufacturing sector, which had been declining. We went from 17% of GDP to 10% in the course of 10 years at first. Uh, that recovered, went stable, and then started to grow again in 2022, and a contribution from our rolling industries. You know, these are things like insured tax, been impacting crypto and biotech, and some of these, these really kind of sustainable growth industries that. I think are very much part of our future. So I, my, my, my title is uh, SSA of the State. I call it the cost for optimism. My background is in technology investing. You can't invest in technology companies for 25 years and not believe, not believe that what you see now is not what it could be. And I'm not a politician with zero effects to those who are, but I'm not sure anyone to vote. I'm just going to call it like I see them. And I see a cost for optimism. I see our population going up. The last few years, when every other state in the region is going down, Massachusetts is losing people, New York is losing people, we are gaining people. And, and here are some of the reasons why I just I think that is. First of all, we put our house away. So during the last decade, our economy was described accurately as in a constant state of fiscal crisis. Since then, uh, right, the fiscal guardrails, we've put our house back in order. You can't build a house uh, if you don't have a proper foundation. And over the last, well, oh, I slipped this slide. Over the last five years, we've had budget surpluses. We've paid down almost $8 million of, of unfunded fund pension liabilities. Um, our, the credit rate is great again. You see, all upgraded our, our, the cost of our debts, and that, that makes the top of fair and that sheet. But we still have work to do. We still have a higher capita debt. But, but it really, we pulled through the hard work of making up for the sins and the mistakes of our past, including passing an historic tax cut. And a tax cut I was just one of the progressive tax. So with that now done, you know, I think we can now start thinking about investing in our future. Now we're in a tight fiscal cycle, I might as well have done that. But I do want to make sure we start to think about some of the areas where we want to invest in the growth of our economy, smart strategic investments. That will be investments in the in the in the industries of the future. So this I covered last year, seven fast sort of state economy. Um, again, I'll pick on everybody else for this. Fast than everybody else, and I will pick on everybody else. <laughs> uh, population growth, I talked about, you know, get everybody else declining. Um, now, when I decided to move to the state in 2011, I didn't analyze the state economy. <laughs> I moved here for all these reasons. I moved here to get my child number two, and I moved here because this is an incredible place to raise a family. And so my thesis for all of you to consider is that is it the pandemic, which none of us want, we wrote the rules in such a way that it benefits the state like the state of Connecticut. In other words, if you can live wherever you want, there's more flexibility about where you live, less structured by a commute to some concrete box in some city. 
Why not live in a place where the, the quality of education is high, where the quality of health care is high, where it is to take care of aging parents? Great place to raise the uh, and that's what we're seeing. And so the reason why this is an important map for us all to understand, we think about things like the opportunity for AI. We we don't let our own skepticism squander the moment. Um, I, I don't think I don't think the skepticism is actually warranted. Um, I, I think what I see now is a reason to really double down on our optimism. And I'm not going to go through it, so I don't have time. There's a whole deck there. I'm happy to walk through the folks, folks through individually. But these are the individual inputs that I think are the important elements of growth that we should continue to foster. And if I think about the opportunity set for AI, and there are others as well that we'll focus on, if I think about the opportunity set for AI, Silicon Valley was not built overnight. I'm not sitting here suggesting I'm going to be successful in building Silicon Valley, although I will try, and I need all your help to do it. But it was built over the course of 50 years, and it was built on the backs of a, that shift in computing paradigm that emerged at the setting of that, that rallied an entire industry and ultimately a culture of rich tolerance. That's what Silicon Valley's greatest assets, the culture of rich tolerance. And I look at these emerging technologies, particularly around AI, and having come from the investment world. This is that big, if not bigger. And I, and I think the adoption of it has been so incredibly fast that I think the commercial, the adoption has always uh, super sort of uh, front loads the commercial application of the technology. But I think the adoption of it was so fast. But I think the commercial application of it will run into the billions, if not the trillions of dollars. And I do think to the point that Senator Roney made, um, it's made about ours being a, a, a knowledge. I do think we have comparative advantage and competitive advantage where this can be our semiconductor. This can be the industry around which we rally and create that culture of response. So I'll stop there. Um, uh, I'm continuing to hold the Chief Innovation Officer title. That was important to me as a technical governor when I signed the Commissioner title for role. You know, I didn't want to send a message to you all to our community that innovation was priority and four months later say just kidding. So I'm going to to hold on to that role because this priority for this administration. Um, by the way, I am the first successor, so I'm not sure you right now. Uh, but but I, I, I do think this is an incredible moment in our shares. Um, and as I said in the last open session, I need all of your help. This is, this is a big effort and it's it's going to take our entire community out of that. With that, I'll stop. Just say thank you once again and hand the mic back to you, Mr. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And before you complain about only getting five minutes, we only gave uh, David Brucci, the, uh, the father of lots of 10 minutes, to explain his 25 years in AI research. So. <laughs> We still don't understand what he said. Yeah, and he spoke very fast. I'm going to watch it at speed. <laughs> it's good to uh, learn. Dan, we're very fortunate to have with us um, from Yale, Dean Lucilla Ono Machado. Um, she is MD, PhD, MBA, so a lot of a lot of degrees. Is the deputy dean for biomedical informatics and the chair of uh, biomedical informatics and data science. As the deputy dean for biomedical informatics. Uh, Dr. Otto Machado oversees the infrastructure related to biomedical informatics research across the academic health systems. Biomedical informatics and data science serves as the hub for biomedical collaboration at Yale. It brings informatics to the clinic and the bedside. Innovates new approaches to the analysis of big data across biomedical research spectrum from basic genetic or proteomics, cellular, and system biology to the understanding of social determinants of health. And works in concert with colleagues in the uh, in data science. So, uh, with that, Dr. Omar Machado. Uh, thank you, and thanks for staying after the last moment. Uh, I think that there is some natural reflection going on, and you are the muted. So, thank, thanks for staying. Uh, let me go to my sharing here. So, so I'm, from, uh, I'm new to Connecticut. Uh, I have a couple more days to claim a lesson year here in North California, where we have started some initiatives there. And from all I absorbed from the discussions today, I can see why we cannot um, advance 
beyond that in the state of Connecticut. So, so I'll, I'll give some opinionated uh, aspects here. So, uh, as opposed to the discussion and some believe that data was everything, some believe that data is not everything, data is very important. So for companies that are trying to get their products for Android devices approved by the FDA, you have to have data to um, say it's working, it's not working, it's working for the connected population. Yeah. So I think there are many ways we can uh, harness the uh, healthcare data from the state in a very safe, in a very privacy preserving manner in order to facilitate the approval of such technologies. I, I don't believe we can do that. Uh, my area is privacy technologies, and uh, it, it's real, it can be done. Uh, it was talked about GPU enclaves. GPU enclaves together with the security is something we need to uh, further develop and put forward because that uh, GPU enclave is, is what um, is needed for AI development. Um, example data for prototyping as well. You know, you, you might have uh, algorithms that you, you can't uh, uh, test on real data until later on, but you can have example data to get started on it. And there could be healthcare systems testing your products and maintaining your IP. And that's very important because uh, there is this dilemma of well, healthcare systems cannot uh, uh, give away their data for multiple, multiple reasons, including privacy, but they can test products, and I think that's very important. Incentives for that need to exist, given all competing um, uh, priorities that um, exist in healthcare systems and more now than, than ever. Prioritization of AI fairness and direct bad practice is also very important. We go by the uh, First, do no harm, do not develop products that will harm oh, the patients, and that's uh, a way to test it. So one other thing, I think your fear, uh, population in general, is because of lack of understanding. What is the real risk? How it comes about? How do we protect from it? And still can share data responsibly and advance AI technology. I would say the current status of federal regulations, there is uh, something called the Health Insurance for the Global Act, the HIPAA, and uh, de identifying data according to HIPAA is just removal of 18 identifiers to dates of services, uh, the current, of course, uh, metric dates, and so on, or an expert certification that's rarely done because there are very few experts who can truly say this is not re identifiable. Uh, there's also some called limited data sets that require, as you know, data use agreements between institutions, but are rarely done with companies. They are done with companies, but um, is not as common as done across research uh, institutions. So that's another thing that probably be facilitated um, in this environment. So I'll give you an example why people. Uh, some say, well, there's no risk if you have the identified data. So imagine you just uh, publishing online the table on the book that is there, but of course not the names, dates of birth, and anything like that. Um, it's very simple if you have the biometric of a person of interest to just go to the table and match it. Right? So let's say it's a fingerprint. You get a fingerprint. From the person of interest, the celebrity can be um, your neighbor, and then you just match against the database and you discover that they are diagnosis and their age. So that's a like uh, it's a breach of privacy, right? That no one wants to have. So there, therefore, biometrics are not allowed in the so-called data identifying data sets. However, if you uh, have feature A and feature B, and you happen to know that Lisa, your neighbor, A, for, for her, A equals 10, B equals 20. Uh, then you can do the same matching if you know she participated in this study, for example, in the data. So there is a risk 
even when you don't have biometrics, when you don't have the typical identifiers, that you can just go to the database, link in my what you're looking for, just read out that stuff. We're all out there. So that's why this database cannot be published very easily and it cannot be uh, downloaded because once you, you don't know who is working with them, we can do all sorts of re identification of persons of interest. And I'm talking about a growing unique, and that's how we know about these of it. Even the row is not unique. In this case, there are two patients with the same A equals 10, B equals 20. If you learn something about uh, this, uh, about Lisa, you don't know if that would be income is between 20 and 60, but you know the background. So you get the idea that just by linking things you know with uh, published data that seemingly the identified data, there is a risk there. So we, we, instead of denying it, we need to fully accept that there is, and how are we going to do uh, so that we can mitigate any risks by having others compute for this data, right? So the, the, the dilemma here, is it ethical to share because people who go to the hospital with a broken leg, many times don't know that their de-identified data can be used for uh, research and for other is it ethical not to share because we're missing out? We are not accelerating science. We're not sharing, and, and that's important. We're not uh, accelerating our technologies. There's lots of good people choose, and we've done this experiment in, in California. And yes, people can. There are lots of people who want to share the data. They want science to advance. They want technologies to advance. So that can be done. Um, I also know that we work with different aspects of it, of different types of data can do. It's not just access control. You can monitor who access data for what purpose and what happens. You can have smart contracts embedded in blockchain, private blockchains, in order to uh, coordinate all that effort. You can do risk analysis. So, so you can see that it's not just the AI per se, but that a lot of other things that enable the data sharing that can happen because of it. And we worked about privacy protection solutions that are good data centric, such as adding noise to data, which is, by the way, how uh, our so-called artificial data, it, it, synthetic data, is typically produced, the, the derivative from real data. Uh, operate on encrypted data, it's called homomorphic, Encryption is out of possible, multi party computation, and a, a bunch of other technical solutions that you have to have the right people in order to place them um, the right way so that we can share more data. Uh, there's also institution people centric ways of just using data brokers, uh, patient defined data sharing, and so on. I'll just be very simple on the kinds of distributed analytics we can do. We can uh, keep all the data in their own health systems and still compute with the overall data of the state. And this is because every uh, health system has the same kind of information and we never need to put them in the same place, which is what health systems typically like. Now with sensor data, with some other data that is added to the electronic health records, companies also have proprietary interest in keeping those data and not sharing uh, necessarily with the health systems, there is something called vertical uh, partitioning for federated learning that we can do as well. So there are algorithms in which you don't need to put the data physically together. You send the computations in a secure and privacy preserving way that you can compute with this data. So these are all, you know, lots of, of these algorithms out there that can be used. In, in California, for quite some time, I was uh, leading a clinical data research network in which we started with the University of California system, which has five major health systems in different regions that never before had the data put in the same place and computed together. So we said, well, there was still this lack of uh, trust. Let's do it in a distributed way first. 
And then later, what happened in southern computer is that these people got comfortable and then the data were finally physically put together, but it wasn't necessary. We compute with other systems in the uh, California area, as well as the VA. So the Veterans Administration has one of the most stringent policies and regulations for how their data is. Uh, as long as we can do it and show that it's done in a privacy protecting manner, uh, they also uh, allow to be part of this network. So it's done, it's doable, uh, it doesn't require too much, you know, uh, sophistication that you wouldn't have uh, already here. Many centers, including the federally qualified health system, we have to receive in which the data duration and the standardization does make fit. So I'll give an example of the community health centers in the Hartford area. They do participate in clinical networks because they have their data standardized. The All of Us program is one of them, uh, as does uh, now Yale and has in other systems as well. Um, so you see how we can operate with data without putting them all into one place. During COVID, that's what we did, because if you remember in the beginning of the pandemic, there were several clinical questions being answered, right? Is this hypertensive medication, ACE inhibitors, is it safe or is it not safe? Uh, you consult with the current health records of several <clears> services, <throat> and then you give an answer to that. So we did have um, questions and answers from electronic health records that we could gather from this large network. Uh, this is actually the, the, the book process of the VA uh, participating uh, hospital and clinics. And then the, in red, you have a few others which we put together to help answer this question, including a health system in Germany that also uh, has very stringent privacy protecting regulations, but could operate with us on this. So uh, in addition to that, we've uh, been in California uh, some privacy protection uh, studies in which data uh, could be instead of uh, managed by the healthcare system, the sharing managed by the healthcare system, we would put into uh, the patient's hands and this is a, a study, it's not in, in practice, but it was for us to understand if it was feasible to ask the patients to let us know what they want to share and what they don't want to share. And we did this on top of a, a data warehouse with this uh, early interface, or we select that one to share with UCSD and the VA hospital locally with nonprofit organizations and for profit organizations. And we, we got to know the answers. There are different um, levels of comfort. And yes, it is possible to implement a system that would respect those preferences. Um, like I said, we did it, and for the duration of the study, we would honor the patient preferences and uh, only include their data in studies that they uh, said that they would like to be included per data item. Of course, not for you to, to read this, but um, the important thing is the dark green on the right hand side. These people are totally comfortable sharing it. And there's a lot of people per item, right? So, about let's say 50, almost 50% 50 of the people are comfortable sharing data with other entities. On the other extreme, on my side here, is people are not comfortable. Uh, sharing data, and I'll give you an example. Four or nine people, including me, do not want to share age with the uh, others. Just, a, just kidding for research. <laughs> <laughs> but there are other items here, and all, up to the very bottom, share my phone number. Right? Please don't share my phone number. That would be fourteen percent. So it is possible, and this is per item. Think about the way it is today. Today, if a patient doesn't want one item to be shared, they can retract completely from research. And they have, it's a, it's a all or nothing, right? You're all in or you're all out. And what you can tell here is, you know, maybe we'll just exclude that one item. I don't know study wants to 
to have them do anyway. And then you can still share the rest of the data. So, so it's an important thing, and, and my uh, reason to show it is because um, it does give more confidence. And, and the people who did it, they said, well, even if I didn't change anything, I feel more comfortable now with what you guys are doing, as I understand. So again, it's just an example of many things that can happen uh, if we have the creativity and so we, we dare to, to ask because I was very impressed that the health system uh, allowed me to do this because there were fears of what if everyone uh, removes the have uh, So they only allowed me to do for a portion of the data and do a lot of scaling. And even for a small scale, we can tell that um, first, the ones who really participate in the study are the ones most concerned about privacy. Some others do only know what to And then from those, we can also see that it's still a large percentage that are very comfortable with the healthcare system managing their preferences for data sharing. So in, in general, I just wanted to close by saying that data sharing to accelerate healthcare innovation is something that I believe we can do within the federal regulations, within the protection of privacy of patients. And if we can um, inform and um, just uh, let people be more comfortable and less afraid, we, we should do that. I think it's, it's uh, a way to, not, not only about privacy, but about AI. It's not this, uh, thing that has a lack in itself, you can turn it on and off, right? Uh, there are many things we need to kind of educate ourselves about. So protecting the privacy of individuals is crucial, there's no question about it, but helping AI modelers find data and test their model, and again, as what both have certified them, is very important, with transparency in data use, Understanding the biases in AI because that's another thing that I don't know what this has much. But the data are, are the data, right? Are people who had access to health care. What about people who don't have access? They are excluded from AI and from a, a lot of the models. So uh, it's very critical that you only apply models to a, a population that resembles this. Uh, an approximation of the patient that you have at hand, then don't use it when uh, that particular type of configuration that never appeared before. Understanding the biases in AI is essential, and I think I'm a shout out for a pair of hours that will come Friday since so it's still embargo. But it uh, defines what's racial bias and helping all of us in general, not just AI in how it needs to be handled from the training data to the modeling to the testing to the monitoring and potential uh, uh, expiration dates and potential also for redressing the bias by bias algorithms. And last of it, we are developing, we have developed a certificate program in medical software and artificial intelligence Again, this is not a degree program, but it's a practical set of online instruction for medical software, regulations about it, and then also an intro to medical AI. And with the um, thinking that medical AI as a medical device will, will enhance regulations as well as the medical software, that um, again, it shouldn't, you know, like, prerequisites to, to attend the course are not the same as a degree program. Also the convenience of online in uh, the inviting uh, speakers, lecturers who are not academics is also very important to us. So this will become soon the, the URL here in case you're interested. And I, I must say, uh, it's been very exciting for me to, to come to Connecticut in this kind of uh, uh, assemblies of, of, of people interested in knowing, you know, how how can we uh, come up as a, a differentiator? So on. I, I think there are many things. One, the, the state is not 
too big and not too small. So there's a lot going on already the healthcare system, uh, like I said, can get prepared to, to do this, um, to participate in studies, to test products and so on. And if we can accelerate that, then more and more people would be coming here to develop and to test their products and to validate products uh, without elsewhere. So with that, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present it. Thank you once again for being the participants uh, in this uh, process. And uh, again, invite you to consider the, this uh, uh, workforce development initiative and many others that we'll uh, do over time. Thank you. Dr. Ormuchata, thank you very much uh, for that talk. And I'll just say we're very excited to have you here uh, in Connecticut. I think one of the things we've heard in a lot of the conversations that in order to make this happen is three things. It's data, ac access to computing power, and then the people. Right. Um, one of the, my concerns with the data has always been how do we make sure we protect them? If their data is safe and everybody is getting their privacy. So give me hope. To hear from you the ways that we can do that, right? We can both protect people and privacy and advance research uh, in the state of Connecticut. And listening to you talk about all the changes that are happening in Connecticut with our you know, GDP leading the country, with people moving in here, that gives me hope you know, for the future of Connecticut. Uh, the other thing in our talk today, I think there are a lot of them, as we said about the fears around AI. But what did we hear you know, when uh, Jody Gillen was talking about AI will enable us to discover drugs better, faster, cheaper? Uh, we heard from uh, Dr. Uh, Senator Saldana about their wearable that will help detect strokes. Um, and we heard about from Joshua Ball about research that was launched out of Yale that looking at the echocardiograms and data from wearables that will identify heart problems. So again, allowing people to live longer healthier and to save money in the healthcare. So a common theme to me from today was hope, uh, the hope from the future for the future. And what do we know from anyone else who's watched Star Wars, we know that revolutions were built up. So as we enter this new technological revolution, I think we can all work together to ensure that we maximize the hope and the potential uh, for the state of Connecticut. So I want to thank Yale for hosting us today. I want to thank uh, MJ for all of his work and putting up with me and getting ready uh, for today. And most importantly, thank everyone. I think the natural selection, the strongest, uh, <laughs> who made it through to the end of this day. Thank Jillian from Yale uh, for all of her work and putting up with me <laughs> over the last couple of weeks and hosting us and carrying in tables, putting up signs uh, to guide us uh, to this room. And, also, as the last thing, I'd just like to invite everyone who did make it through to the end um, to Christopher Martins. Uh, they are going to be putting out some food for us, so we will have a little bit of a networking uh, reception and a, a happy hour over there. So uh, thank you. And again, please make sure that we have your information so that we can stay in touch as we continue to work on this uh, on this policy and on this uh, preparing our state for this next revolution. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.